talk and use my hands a lot, but I'm a little bit tied to the lectern the way the presentation worked out. So just some logistical housekeeping things before we get started. Okay, having said that, I'm delighted and honored to be here today. I know this expert speaker series has included some really remarkable folks in the ABA community, and I'm humbled to kind of be a part of that lineage in some small way. Uh, and I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Mary Jane, Stacy for all your help, and to Jen Croner, who many of you know here, who helped facilitate my invitation here uh, by slipping me in the back door, so to speak. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge a few of you in the audience, although I think Jen might be the only one here. Oh, Samantha's here. Hi, Samantha. Um, because I had the great pleasure of working with uh, Samantha and Jen and Ashley also um, during their ABA practicums, which they completed at REMED. And I think their skills and professionalism were exemplary and greatly appreciated on an individual basis. And I also want to say at an organizational level, we're having worked at REMED for 22 years, I think their skills really reflected well on Melmark's preparation uh, and training and the experience that they gained here. So I just think at a collegial level as organizations, I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so for my goal, my goal for the talk today is a rather ambitious one. Uh, it's not often that I have this much time, or almost this much time at this point, to talk about brain injury to a behavior analytic audience. Um, so as part of my opening salutation, I will offer you a phrase we're fond of saying in remit, which is, thank you and I'm sorry. So I'm going to talk really fast, okay, to try to work through this thing. So um, I'll begin with providing an overview of brain injury, including a basic orientation to the anatomy of the brain, nothing too technical or homuncular, of course, uh, the types of brain injuries that can occur and how severity is determined. I'll round out that discussion with a review of the types of settings in which care is provided, from acute to post-acute, and from long to short term. I'll then turn towards the conceptual and applied utility of behavior analysis and brain injury by introducing a hallmark characteristic of TBI that profoundly impacts the behavior change process, known as awareness. Lastly, I will present three case studies that I believe are representative of the broad range application of the philosophy, principles, and procedures of behavior analysis in the rehab and recovery efforts with this unique and complex population, all the way down to the most basic underpinnings of the four-term contingency. So let's get started by talking, anybody remember, am I showing my age by showing this slide? Okay, so let's get started by talking a little bit about the brain. <clears throat> Okay, so we'll start, this is just what I take to be like what we would do for a, what we call brain injury education 101 arena. When we're bringing new employees in and we want to give them a basic orientation to the areas of the brain and what those areas are responsible. So that's what I'm going to provide here briefly as a sort of a pretext for our later conversations. So starting from the bottom and moving our way up and then forward towards some of the more complicated, complex areas of the brain. We're talking about the brain stem and the cerebellum, which are located at the, you know, sort of where the spinal cord meets the bottom of the brain. And this is where the basic life functions are managed by the brain, if you will. Um, we're talking about breathing, heartbeat, um, arousal levels, those kinds of things. And brain stem injuries can be a very serious uh, issue because when you're talking about those kinds of things being impaired, it can create severe complications at other levels, as we'll talk about further. Um, and then the cerebellum and balance and coordination kinds of issues. I'll talk a little bit about balance and coordination in different contexts later, but moving on up through the brain then. We're going to go to the uh, occipital and temporal lobes. Okay, so that's sort of the back and sides of your brain, not all the way back around. Well, all the way back is occipital, and then kind of around to the sides, temporal. Uh, the temporal lobe is uh, language, music, short-term memory. Again, you can look at these fancy little busts of heads that have all these things kind of neatly mapped out. Uh, I know sometimes I, I feel like it's just a bunch of lights and circuits and electronics, and we really just want to know what's going on outside, and that's, of course, important. That's our business. Uh, but it is helpful to have a little bit of an understanding about the inside story in this regard, um, as it does suggest in terms of, you know, especially in a post-acute way, lifelong issues and deficits that folks are going to deal with are tied to some of these regions of the brain in specific ways in terms of the locality of the injuries. So the occipital lobe is vision that's in the back. Uh, we've had folks that kind of fall backwards, hit their head, and there's disruptions in vision. There's other ways visions can be, vision can be impaired as well, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, then we're moving on up and through the back, all the way to the top, and then the front of the brain, where really the high-end kind of supercomputer stuff, as people like to call it, lives, and that's the executive functions. Uh, attention concentration, emotional control, body movement, you know, the, the prefrontal, the motor cortex, the strip up there, um, speech, awareness, which again is going to be part of the focus of the talk this afternoon, 
parietal lobes in terms of touch and sensation and perception. So this is just a little bit of a walk around the brain for those of you that maybe it's been a while since you had a psych course if you had one or some of the neuropsychs in the room. Um, certainly appreciate some of this information. So moving forward towards the actual injury of the brain, I wanted to introduce some statistics from um, data published by the CDC. So how do brain injuries occur? Um, you guys can see that, okay, that's good. So these are from 2012, these data. And so what we've got are 35% falls, 10 assault, 17 motor vehicle. When I started in brain injury in 1995, um, motor vehicles were the predominant um, etiology of brain injury, the cause of brain injury. That's since changed, and there's obvious reasons why that is. Um, <clears throat> elderly now substantiate an enormous percentage of this falls population, and the very young. So the most likely to suffer a brain injury as a result of a fall are kids, and I have a nine and 12 year old at home. Kids between the ages of zero and four, and adults between the ages of 70 and up in terms of elderly when there's mobility issues that put them at risk for falls. So that, that's now a prevailing feature uh, of a brain injury. Um, motor vehicle accidents, of course, is no surprise. Assaults, we, we have worked with folks who suffered unfortunate assaults, whether that's a, a, a literally like, a, a, these are some graphic terms, a bludgeoning assault, um, or like a gunshot assault. We've had a few gunshot wounds that we've served uh, the, the, from the nature of an assault, struck by or against some kind of a force. Um, and I'll talk about coup, contra coup, and closed head injuries. And then 21% other are unknown. Uh, we've served folks, you know, some of these stories are really tragic. I won't go into too much depth, but just to touch on them, to give you a sense of the spectrum of ways in which this occurs, we've worked with a number of folks who've sustained their brain injuries as a result of an overdose. So drug use, overdose, anoxia, hypoxia, that type of situation. We've also had folks that have tried to commit suicide and hang themselves unsuccessfully, but to the extent that they sustain some sort of a hypoxic or anoxic event. As you know, like it doesn't take much, a couple minutes, four to six minutes before, with a lack of oxygen to the brain, to sustain some kind of an injury. Uh, and now with the way the technology is, and I'll get that into a minute, uh, in medical technology, and the ability to keep people alive after the kinds of injuries that they've sustained, we've had people who've been anoxic for 20, 30, 40 minutes uh, we actually served a, an orthopedic surgeon from the eastern part of New York who had been power walking in a park. He went into cardiac arrest in, a, in the park. An ambulance showed up, <clears throat> pardon me, to pick him up, and their defibrillator was broken. And it was a 35 minute ride to the hospital. So he was incapacitated for, for 35 minutes in the back of a hospital wagon. Uh, before he got to the hospital, and they were able to revive him. So we're talking about 35 minutes of anoxia. And, and I'll, probably talk too long about this right now, but anoxia is a really complicating feature of brain injury because it's not a localized injury in the way in which I just went around the sort of geography of the brain. It's a globally affecting, and it can be the kind of thing that shows up here, shows up there. So as a clinician, from an assessment side, it's real ephemeral. And from the client, the patient side, and I, I use the word clients, just that's our nomenclature at REMA, just so you know. Um, so our clients that have anoxic injuries are very difficult to work with because to try to pinpoint what's going on from a functional standpoint from our regard, it might shift and change and orientation is really impaired. So anoxia is an especially complicating feature of brain injury. So the survival data, and I think these are very interesting to go over just again from a general education standpoint of brain injury. Uh, between you know, 1989 and 1998, there was an 11.5% increase in the survival rate of brain injury. Okay? And then between 1997 and 2009, there was another 8.5%. So 20% in 20 years. And it's no surprise, so I'm 45, and I remember when there used to be phone booths on the corners, and there were phones on the walls, with these, they used to have cords on them, believe it or not, on the walls in your house. And that was the only way you could get a hold of somebody if something happened. So if you're driving down the road in 1980, and you see a horrific accident on the side of the road, unless you're a trauma surgeon, you're driving down the road to get to the closest payphone. You hope you have a quarter in your pocket to dump in there to call and say, something just happened. Well, where did it happen? Oh, I don't know, uh, like mile marker 28. You know, you have to give all this, and now you call on your cell phone. They know right where you are. They get there in minutes. And I've seen slides, I don't have any for this talk because it would be too laborious, of these new, tr basically, trauma you know, centers on wheels, these ambulances that they're linked right into, anybody remember the old TV series ER? That kind of like, you know, links the, the time frames together here. 
You know, now they know so much more about the patient coming in the door. They're able to do so much more in the field, quote unquote. I think Bob Woodruff's story is a good example of this. Part of the reason why he survived his injury to the extent that he has, he was in a neurotrauma tent within 20 minutes, and they were evacuating pressure from his brain from the blast injury he sustained that he was involved in when he was embedded as a journalist. And that had an unbelievable impact on his recovery. What would have happened 20 years ago is they would have had to throw him in probably a helicopter, get him somewhere, there would have been pressure, cranial pressure, hemorrhaging going on that was uncontrolled until he got somewhere where they could intervene. Similarly with um, Gabby Gifford, you know, folks have seen some of that story. You know, I think that's an unbelievable, an unbelievably heroic story. Um, I think what's difficult from a clinical side of the watching her recovery video on the 20 minute special is it really cut, and they have to do this, but it cuts out a lot of the long hours that went into a lot of the training and rehab that she underwent. But it's a terrific story how people can survive these horrific injuries. And so what that's done to our world in terms of brain injury rehab is it's increased complexity astronomically coming in the door to us because more people are surviving injuries than they were 20 years ago. So to that end, I now want to move into this segment where I want to show you how brain injury happens. Uh, now these aren't overly graphic videos, but they're jarring and potentially a little bit unsettling. So I just want to give you that forewarning. Minute 15 to go, Leafs threatening again. Ty Domi off the centering feet for Robert Reichel, but Ash Oh, you guys heard the audio, which is because a flyer's game, in case you didn't figure that out. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll give you a little bit, in case I can come back to those later. There's a video of uh, Sammy Kaplan, who played for the Flyers about a decade ago or so, sustaining a terrific hit against the boards. I don't mean terrific, like awesome. I mean terrific, like incredibly fierce, like hit. Um, that takes him right off his feet, feet leaves him parallel you know, to, the, to the ice surface. And then he gets, he lays on the ice for a half, a half a second or two, tries to get up, can't move, drops the stick, looks disoriented, motorically he's a mess, and sustained a severe concussion as a result of that injury, which of course now is all over the news with the NFLPA and CTE studies, and I'll reference those in a little bit. But this concussion piece is really important, and I think this Kapanen video, if we can get to it at some point, illustrates it really, really well. And this is why there's so much attention, appropriately so, given now to treating people immediately after they sustain a concussion in a very specific way. Because there's all kinds of, it's not just that they potentially brain bruise their brain, but there's a lot of neurochemical and metabolic kinds of processes occurring that are active. And they need to settle down before you get exposed to, God forbid, a second concussion or a third or a fourth. And that's why all these lawsuits now in the NFL are kind of emerging. And it's a really big deal. You know, I don't know if anybody saw or you know, saw the, the um, concussion movie with Will Smith, which was based on the book Brain Games, which was written by a guy named Chris Dewitsky, who got together with, uh, I forget the name of the, the forensic guy that Will Smith played the character of, but um, it's a terrific story. It's a, it's a tragic story, but I think a really important one. Um, the second video is one of a cab driver from a dash cam facing in who falls asleep. It's called Sleepy Cabby. And if we don't get to it, you can YouTube it. It's easy to find. It's called Sleepy Cabby. And it's, it's violent. Um, you don't see any blood or guts. It's not violent in that kind of way. Uh, but it's, oh, hey, here we go. Thanks to the magic of Dave, we'll get to see the fire here. Right Minute 15 to go, Leafs threatening again. Ty Domi off the centering feet for Robert Reichel, but Ash with the save, 134 for him. Domi bumming, we got OT in the overtime. Look at that hit. Darcy Tucker just laying out Sammy Kapanen, and I mean, I know this looks kind of funny when you look at it. Kapanen having all kinds of problems, but so you can man, see, you think about what's going on there. That, that is that scrambled X right there, Bill. That is downright scary. Kapanen did eventually make it back to the bench. Let me show it one more time. I mean, literally parallel to the ice, right off the skates. Right, and then just lost in space. You know, I don't know how many folks here played sports. I grew up playing sports, had my bell rung a couple of times. Never quite like that, thank God. But you sustain one of those, that's horrific. If you sustain multiples of those, especially within a short course of time, that's a serious brain injury. Need to go. Leaves threatening again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we go. Cool. All right, so here's the second one then. I think. <laughs> 
surgery. He's got some sort of significant brain injury. We're not sure what it might look like yet. Whether it's open or closed, I'll get into that in a minute. But I'll move through that briskly for the, for the sake of time. But those videos have an impact and they're intended to do that. And I really want folks to, to have a sense of what we're talking about here because for both of all, Kapanen's okay. I mean, I've seen him in videos since at Flyers things. It's not like he sustained any long-term uh, side effects per se from that, although I don't know him personally enough to know whether there is or any. Um, and then the cabby thing is just really horrific. And those are the kinds of folks that we serve. You know, they wind up in some kind of motor vehicle accident. And you think about texting now, which wasn't even a thing 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And the kinds of things that can happen with a half a second of inattention to the road. And the next thing you know, you lose control. And you're not wearing your seatbelt. Now, what the seatbelt would have done is hard to know without watching video. Uh, there still would have been some sort of an event, obviously. If he had fallen asleep, losing control of his car, there would have been some kind of an event. Um, but it probably would have looked a little less horrific than what we saw. Um, and I don't know the story of what happened to the sleepy cabbie. I just happen to have the video that we use at work to try to really make the point, you know. All right, cool. So when a brain injury happens, there's actually two types of injuries. The first is the primary, and that's caused by the initial blow or insult to the brain, right? The secondary one comes from swelling, bleeding, hemorrhaging, contusions, those kinds of things where the brain's affected and bruised beyond the actual point of contact or injury as it originally occurred. So the, taking the cabbie example, you know, he hit the various parts of that car, obviously internally, went through the back passenger window. So all of those things would be classified as the primary injury sources. But the secondary injury, there's probably a lot of bleeding going on, there's swelling going on, um, and that can have, if that's, again, if that's not evacuated as quickly as possible, that puts pressure on the brain, and that can cause long-term side effects. So there's three different types of head injuries, general categories, there's open head injuries, and as I, there's penetration of the skull, I mentioned bullet wounds once, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one of the most famous brain injury survivors of all time, and that is Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker in the early 19th century. At the age of 24, they were working on the railroad, and they were blasting to kind of work through this space, and during one part of the blast, a tamping iron, it was a good length, shot up from the railroad and went right through his skull. And this is a depiction of that sort of, you know, sort of from a sketch. And he survived. And it was remarkable that he survived. I mean, this is a horrific injury. They got the tamping iron out of his head. There's pictures of him online if you want to look up Phineas Gage. Um, he was blind on the one side, and it was a left frontal temporal injury that he sustained. So he was 24 when this happened. He lived to be 36. As far as outcomes are concerned, what I read and researched as much as was available, he didn't return to work, which happens to lots of our guys, unfortunately. And he wasn't quite the same guy from very loose reports. You know, he, some of them, and I know this is speculative, but he used a lot of profanity, but that sounds like my everyday. He was really inappropriate sexually, that sounds like my everyday. And this is at work, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's what happened. And that makes sense, because that's what our guys look like. You know, we're, I forgot to say, but. You know, remit is serves adults. So we're talking about adults with brain injuries, 18 and up, right? All the way to into their 70s from different types of origins. So again, open uh, can come from some kind of penetration or the skull is obliterated in the accident, which might have happened to the sleepy cabbie. And later they either have to piece your skull back together. Believe it or not, in some accidents, if they, they do a craniotomy, they have to they actually take a part of your skull out to relieve pressure. They put it sometimes in your belly or they'll put it in a freezer which sounds funky, but that's what they do. And then later on, when swelling's resolved and things are better, they try to put it back in. If they can't, they'll mold something out of mesh or some kind of material. And it's important, actually, Jen and I were just, Jen's been doing some work with one of our guys who just had a cranioplasty, meaning a, his, part of his cranium was put back together, and it helps normalize and regulate pressure. And sometimes that can have good effects of behavior. And that's part of the four-term. It's an EO, that's an organismic thing, and we'll get into that in a minute. So then there's closed head injuries, and this is the, the, the biggest part of what I think we, we want to focus on here, 
for the purposes of our discussion, general brain injury purposes, and also just, I think, life education about the brain purposes, is this closed head injury. And coup contra coup is a fancy French term for your brain hitting the front of your head and then rebounding back and hitting the back of your head. Okay, so your brain's kind of sitting up there. It's about three and a half pounds, the size of a big grapefruit, right? Bathed in cerebral spinal fluid, sitting up there, resting up there nicely, and all of a sudden it comes into contact with some hard object. And what happens is the force of that drives your brain forward, but then there's a rebound effect. And the rebound is it hits then the back of your head. And both of those things can cause swelling, bleeding, bruising, all of which can contribute to some sort of neurologic deficit, contusions, hematomas. Then there's the fuse axonal injury. And then the thing to know about the fuse axonal is axonal shearing. In the next slide, I'll make a little more sense about that, make a little more sense out of that. And then there's CT, which stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the outcome or result of repeated trauma to the brain. And that's that sort of Sammy Kapanen video which back in that day, I don't know, maybe he went back in the locker room and laid down to get some smelling salts and put them back out there the next day for the next game, I don't know. But that, that's happened a lot. Obviously, there's many more protocols in place now for um, those kinds of injuries or events, which is a fortunate thing. So this is a little bit about that diffuse axonal because a lot of people, once they sort of, a lot of the swelling subsides, people think, okay, we're good. But what can happen in the midst of those kinds of injuries, there can be shearing. Shearing of tissue, right, at one level, but also shearing at a much more molecular neurochemical level, so to speak, around the neurotransmitters and these axons that live in the gray and white matter areas. And those can be sheared or torn or stretched. And all of those things, like think about electrical wires, those were stretched or sheared, they don't quite work properly. And so those kinds of the injuries at that level, at that sort of you know, layer of neuroanatomy, can have lasting effects on function. And using, again, it's funky when you're in the rehab world because everybody likes to use the word function, and then I use the word function, and they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. And I'm thinking, oh, function, of course. Cool. So talking different languages sometimes. But no worries here, we're good. So I really just want to make a point about that external shearing and that diffuse external injury. I think that's important. Okay, and then there's ABI. There's going to be a picture up here, which is a, one in a word as a picture of the brain, which makes it, I think, pretty cool. It's a remarkable shot. Um, but it just gives you a sense, you know, of what the brain looks like, you know, and how many millions of vessels of blood there are and types of tissue that's there. And so acquired brain injury is another type. So there's open head, there's closed head, and then there's acquired, right? So there was no concussive traumatic event. Someone had an aneurysm, which we know happens. Unfortunately, people are affected by those things every day, strokes, cardiac arrest, uh, tumors, encephalitis, which is like a disease process in the brain. Uh, anoxia, hypoxia, or poisoning. Those kinds of ways are all ways in which the brain is affected uh, and you could sustain an acquired brain injury, which may have you know, temporary or lasting effects depending upon the nature of the injury. I don't have any more gross pictures or, or jarring videos. We should be good going forward. Okay, so how do you measure severity of a brain injury? So part of it is, how long were you out cold? Loss of consciousness, LOC. There's also something which was developed in 1974 called the glass calcoma scale. And believe it or not, the GCS is still used to this day on site within the first 48 hours to estimate severity of injury. And it measures three things, eye opening, verbal responses, and motor responses. And it's also, again, believe it or not, fairly predictive in a general way with outcomes. So the more severe or low your GCS score time of injury generally predicts more guarded outcomes compared to higher GCS. Um, PTA, which is post-traumatic amnesia, there's now something called persistent P, there's PPTA, like it just keeps going, um, which is really problematic. You know, this is like uh, amnestic, like people really have recall of 10, 30 seconds or less. I walk into somebody's room, I introduce myself, they're very cordial, very polite, they say hello, I leave, I come in and they say, hey, how are you? And it's like we never met before. And that happens at our site with some routine. So think about how that impacts the fundamental process of learning. You're, you're banking on somebody being able to establish relations over repeated trials or exposure, and you go into the room and you could, you could leave for a minute and a half, and you come back in and it's like a brand new day. And they don't know who you are or where they are, or they think they're somewhere else. And, I'll get into that later, but this is all part of the brain injury rehab world. 
And then there's this Rancho scale, Rancho Los Amigos, which was the name of the hospital where it was developed, which measures other features of, and it's also used again within early parts of injury, and then sometimes later on at certain intervals to gauge uh, severity. Or, or, but it's not quite as predictive long-term as the GCS is. But this is how med severity is measured. Okay, and then how do you estimate severity? Okay, so you measured it, how do you estimate? What's gonna happen? Well, what do you call mild, what do you call moderate, what do you call severe? And these are just some numbers, and I'm gonna go through this quick in the interest of time. So everything's there. So mild is under 20 minutes out, 13 to 15, so high GCS. Your motor, your verbal, your eye, pretty responsive to stim. Um, PTA is less than 24 hours, so you might be really confused for a period of time. That clears and resolves mild TBI. However, in my experience, there's really nothing mild about mild TBI. Because even though you've regained consciousness and you've got your motor and wits about you, so to speak, there could be DAI, that diffuse axonal having happened as a part of your injury, and all of a sudden that has, you might be in and out of the ER in 20 minutes or maybe a couple hours, depending on which ER you go to and how busy that is. But that might not necessarily mean you don't have lasting effects of some particular type, moderate all the way through to severe. Most of the folks that we see are in the moderate to severe category. And I don't mean severe to mean that you're forever in a vegetative state in a bed sort of hooked up like this young woman is. It just means severe from the standpoint of impairment. Okay, so you still might be walking and talking. Matter of fact, we've got a six foot five, 240 some, 50 some pound guy out at our site right now who, let's see, 48 or 49, and 12 years ago as an adjuster uh, for an insurance company fell off a roof. And hasn't been the same since. And he had to live in, he's had to live in a structured setting ever since that happened. His kids at the time were about the age of my kids. They were like nine and 12. Now they're early 20s, late teens. So they lived much of their adolescent life with their father with a profound brain injury. He doesn't necessarily always recognize them. Doesn't calls me Darnell every day. My name's Chris and I tell him that and then I leave and I come back. He says, hey Darnell. So I'm Darnell. So this is what it can look like. So from that standpoint, it's pretty severe. Walks and talks, you know, but needs all kinds of help for every part of his routine. That's profound and disorienting. So then again, for the purposes from a brain coming into this ABA world with a little bit of brain injury, where do people go? Will they get evacuated or get that some kind of emergency evaluation at the time of injury? Maybe in an emergency, an emergency department, especially neurotrauma, multi-trauma units exist. There's a ton of those around. Life flights, all these ways in which we have to get people in somewhere and miraculously bring them back to life. But the other end is different. And then into the ICU. So that's more like the linear progression of the, the early part. Then there's this post-acute, which is a term used for like this broad swath of care after you've come out of the hospital. And that could start with something like, people are probably familiar with like Grimmar Rehab, maybe Moss Rehab, and he re I mean, we have some wonderful nationally world-renowned ho rehab hospitals in our backyards, and we're lucky to have those. So they exist here on that far left side, um, and they do great work. But when I started a remit in 1995, people stayed there a year and a half. Now they stay there six weeks because they got to get in and they got to get out. Funding's changed, guidelines have changed in terms of admission lengths. So people were surviving more complex injuries. They're spending less time in acute rehabs. And then what happens? And that's sort of where the rest of this slide goes. So we live in the middle. This is remit here. And remit is, that's where I work is post acute residential. But remit also has these sites. Um, independent, well, supported living, supported living apartments, so small group homes, probably what, again, this part fits probably together with what a lot of you are accustomed to. You know, people needing some kind of structured environment, and that structure looking like different types and forms depending upon their level of independence, and what their need is in an ongoing way for assistance and support, right? So that part's not too uncommon. But then there's, what you can't see too well, I apologize, down here, that's our long-term acute care, and this says subacute. So once somebody comes out of the intensive care, then it's, it can be a matrix of experiences for them. They can go home, which happens sometimes, then come to us because it just wasn't working. And wasn't working sometimes looks like screaming and yelling at the outpatient lady that showed up at their door to do PT with them. Or refusing to go out of the house and, and go to the doctor's office. Or refusing to take their medications, or it can look like severe aggression or substance abuse. And all of a sudden, home becomes unsafe. And so they come to us or maybe they've been in some other kind of facility and it's been unsuccessful and they come to us. And we start again in the middle 
and work our way from there. And some of what I'm going to show you on the case study side is going to cover how we try to move people and progress them really truly through the roots of ABA from one particular part of the continuum of remed to another. All right? We've developed some tools and ways to do that. And I'm also going to do that with the, you know, the undercurrent of how awareness affects this whole thing. Um, okay, so these are the types of places where people can come and go after they've left the hospital. Where's the other part of the slide? It's all connected. Okay, so what about outcomes? Okay, we talked about how, what the brain looks like, what kinds of injuries it can, we can sustain, you know, what the severity looks like, where you go, and what about outcomes? Okay, so research and stats, which of course we all are friendly with. Significant impact on life, no kidding, right? That's an understatement. But these data from as recent as 06 and 94, class issues with returning to home and work. So like I talked to you about this insurance, insurance adjuster. No chance of going back to work. Started out back at home, couldn't recognize his wife, couldn't recognize his kids, became episodically agitated. This guy was a tight end at Duquesne. He's a big dude. Big, big guy, really physically fully capable. Walking, talking, but disoriented and agitated and screaming and yelling. And that's dangerous, obviously, in a home setting. So it couldn't get back to home. Social relationships, it ripples through everyone. It affects the individual first and foremost, and then ripples through their life and affects their spouse, their kids, their immediate family, their you know social networks. Many of those things, the divorce rate is something it used to be in the 80s, I think it's in the 90s now, post-injury. And sometimes, sadly, that's a financial decision because it's a whole thing about how you access funding, and some families have to really make that difficult decision. Um, we've been involved in some of that, in some of those situations before. 40% have unmet needs after TBI, uh, upset, controlling temper, problem solving, and the risk. The other thing, too, is once you've had one TBI, you've got about an 85% chance of a second. And that's all the, the highest, I don't have a, a pie chart for this, but the highest percentage of that is because of falls. So people have ambulation mobility issues, they have crappy awareness about it, and they fall. Sometimes it's about assault, they get agitated, they get into a fight with somebody, they hurt themselves. Sometimes it's overdose. Post-injury, think about all these things in your life change in an instant, you wake up, you're not sure why it all happened, everybody's gone, okay, so you start using. And the next thing that happens, some people are using different things and you can sustain an overdose, and a second injury, and this time it's an anoxical on top of the one that you sustained earlier. And we've treated people with those kinds of histories. So those are pretty powerful data. But then there's these other data. And these are the data, I'm, I'm familiar with both sides of this, but especially this right side. Because part of my job is to interact with families quite a bit. Um, and they all tell these kinds of stories for the folks that come to our site. It goes from zero to 100 in a heartbeat. Didn't see it coming. What just happened? I'm walking on eggshells constantly. You feel like there's this ever-present, unpredictable, aversive setting. And you know what happens if you put an organism in an, in an environment where there's aversive stim in an unpredictable schedule. That's, well, that's the worst circumstance you can put somebody in. And that's what lots of these families do. It's unpredictable, they just don't know when it's going to happen, and it's aversive, it's powerful, it's potent, and it's intense. So, and, sadly, it's like a completely different person. <laughs> you guys can't see that. So it truly is. I mean, it's these kind of like little changes. Again, the other thing I want to say is brain injury doesn't change necessarily who people are, per se. More specifically, it amplifies or dampens generally parts of their personality. So it's not that they've changed completely, but that's enough to the people that are closest to them where it feels profoundly different. And they just can't manage it, especially when it involves safety. You know, I think there's lots of families out there, and they're generally in the outpatient world, where they come to love their spouse or loved one just as they did and, and how they are now, and that's wonderful. But there's other situations where those changes co-occur with intense neurobehavioral issues, and that just creates a safety risk that's, that's too large for the home environment. So what do we do as behavior analysts? We've got these complicated problems, these terrible stories. And we bring science to the floor, right? And the cool thing is, I think to me, one of the, one of the most powerful roots of this science is the way we organize the relations associated with the behaviors that I've been referencing thus far. And as part homage to Phil Heinlein, my uh, mentor at Temple, he wrote this great article in 1990, um, when I was much younger, uh, in JAB, okay? And it was, and the, the focus of Phil's article 
was largely about language. And if any of you know Phil, he's a standard bearer for the language of behavior analysis. Um, so the, the, the thrust of this diagram was to say, look, we should be speaking in tripolar terms, not the typical bipolar terms of, organ, of organism behavior. And we have to add environment into that lexicon, which, of course, we're all well-schooled in. So Phil wrote about this. But I found this, which I found the article in that sense incredibly helpful. Confusing, but helpful. <laughs> and eventually it made sense. But in terms of helping staff and families make sense and depersonalize what's beginning to happen since this injury has occurred, this is a powerful diagram. Because it, at least it illustrates the separation of behavior from the organism. And attributes it, some, that, you know, attributes it in some way to relations in the environment in the organism. So it kind of separates things out a little bit. And the phrase I use for staff is it's relational, not personal. Because all of a sudden you've got you know, grown people saying terrible things about you, the way you're dressed, the way your hair looks, they hate your glasses, they hate women, they hate men, they think you're fat, they think you're skinny, they think you're too tall, too short. They'll say these things bold-faced to you. We've had people quit because they just can't tolerate the offensiveness of some of the things that some of the people who work with say. And it's true. So it's really important that we help staff depersonalize. Also, from our standpoint, <clears throat> it sets up this idea that we can look at the organism separate from the environment, separate from behavior. We can address organismic or organic issues, of which there are no shortage, separate from environmental issues, but then in combination with environmental issues to try to produce the behavior that's going to most benefit this individual towards being more independent. And I think in those ways, it's very useful. So I'm going to go through quickly here what kind of things can change after TBI. On the or organismic side or organic side, this is of course not an exhaustive list. Pain, no kidding. That cavity might have fractured a number of parts of his body, shoulders, neck, all those kinds of things. That can create clear and obvious things on x-ray like you know breaks and fractures and things like that. You know, sometimes they can put rods and screws in people and put them back together that way. But then there's the other kinds of pain, like neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia pain, soft tissue trauma, all of which can be real sources of pain that show up nowhere, except in someone's verbal report, which is tricky. Because some of our folks, that verbal report in the doctor's office means they get opioids. Okay? Or that verbal report in a lawyer office means they have a lawsuit, workers' comp lawsuit potentially. Now, it might just be a very honest report and they need help, and that's true, but it's, it can be convoluted as well. And I'm not calling into question anybody's you know, reporting of pain. I'm just bringing to bear from a behavior analytic standpoint the kinds of contingencies that operate on people's reporting of these kinds of features that are even difficult to examine. Um, sleep issues, medication, vestibular issues, vestibular is your inner ear system, and how it moderates uh, your body uh, and processes information so you know where your body is in space. If anybody's ever been seasick, anybody ever know, anybody knows anybody with vertigo, these are disorders of body movement and body in space. You feel disoriented, you feel queasy. We've had people, I was describing earlier to somebody, we had an iron worker from the Bronx who fell off a bridge, um, and he was a, he was a rough guy, he was a, he was a big tough guy. But he had fallen off this bridge and he wore a hood, dark glasses, and walked like this. Very slowly, everywhere he went. Because he felt as soon as he got within shoulders width, he was going to fall over. He had, and he couldn't tolerate, you know, um, uh, light, right? So he had, a, he had a profound sensitivity to light, and he had a profound sensitivity to sound as a result of this disruptive vestibular system. And he was a, he was a mad guy. So some of that stuff got better, and that's not part of the story later, but, uh, but that's how difficult this can be. Medications, okay, uh, they're always involved, in, especially in the work that we do with the kind of complexity that we treat at the at Blue Hill Pond, the campus where I work. Um, there can be neuroanatomical, there can be lobectomies, funnel lobectomies, temporal lobectomies, because areas of the brain are so damaged or bruised or swollen that they need to be removed. Um, there can be PTA and contusions, bowel and bladder issues, on spasticity, muscle contractures, speech, hearing, and vision, and mobility issues. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. On the environment side, I've mentioned some of these things already. Oops, Obviously, changes in social media, the contingencies, access to preferred activities is limited or structured. All of a sudden, you go from kind of working and doing what you wanted after work for the most part or on the weekends to living in some structured setting where people are telling you it's time to get up, time to go to the bathroom, time to take your medications, time to eat your meal, profound changes in people's lives. Demand increases due to need for support. All of a sudden, you can't just go in the bathroom and use it by yourself. You need somebody to supervise your transfer or even more in, 
you know, sort of invasively, they need to support you physically to transfer, get you from one spot to the next. And I'm sure some of you all in the work that you do are engaged in some of these kinds of, you know, features of activities of supporting ADLs. With adults, it's obviously from a different source. Prior to all this happening, they were doing all these things quite well on their own. And now all of a sudden, I'm inviting myself into the room to help them get changed or use a urinal or go into the bathroom. Um, and that's obviously very invasive. No work, there's a financial impact, and social networks are profoundly affected. Okay, so this one's easy. <laughs> So the three and four term. And I only put this up here because, uh, and, and for those of you that are involved with talking with families or providers outside of maybe your own immediate context, you used to have to talk in an ABC terms to try to at least promote some organizational relations and some maybe preliminary data collection. Of course, for us, you know, the four term is the more precise and sort of, you know, definitive construct. Uh, and the EO is really Part of what I want to talk about, you know, that's the opening sort of the title, because in brain injury, as I just sort of tried to illustrate through that organic slide and the organismic changes, there are a terrific amount of changes in from the EO standpoint. And I know there's a lot of debates about MOs, and I won't get on my soapbox about my disliking of the MO. I'll keep that quiet for now. But I grew up in the establishing operation day and age, and I like that term quite fine. And the way it was sort of simply put to me through reading a lot of Jack Michael and talking to Heinlein about it is, it's like the status of the organism. I know it affects, we know it affects reinforcers, we know it affects reinforcer, you know, reinforcer access and potency rather and behavior probabilities, but that's fundamentally because it's, something's affected with respect to the status of the organism. And because that status is affected, other things become more or less important. And in brain injury, that can be pain, that can be sleep, that can be medication changes, that can be all those other things on that side of the board on the left that I listed. And so what we bring in as a science of behavior analysis to this is, Let's try to organize this, not just at the organic environment behavioral level, but at the level of the four term, to really try to drive treatment decisions, whether they be medical or, you know, for the OT or the PT, we have to bring all these things into focus. And the reason I'm showing this term to this slide rather too is, it's also, we've used this as a way to evolve our philosophy for neurobehavioral programming, which I think is kind of cool. So this philosophy that I mentioned, why is that important? <laughs> Well, just like anybody else, you know, behavior analysts, there's, we have a philosophy of things, right? And so what we're lucky enough at Riemann to have done is kind of imbued what we do with behavior analysis to the extent that it's become a, philo a neurobehavioral philosophy for our organization. And our, we published about this and, and had good success presenting on it. So, you know, guides an interdisciplinary team, it's comprehensive, integrated, because again, at our site, because of the complexity we, we treat, we have an interdisciplinary team. So there's OTs, PTs, speech therapists, Therapeutic recreation specialists, drug and alcohol counselors, psychologists, um, rec, rec therapists, many of which I'm sure you folks are accustomed to interacting with. And they're all typically on site because we treat on site in clients' rooms, in dining rooms, in kitchens, and everywhere else. But you have to have a way to kind of organize all those people. You know, if they work in their silos and exclusive of one another, which of course they never do, that's kind of productive. So this philosophy kind of drives, and I'm going to present a model in a moment, um, drives things together, pulls them together, I should say. And again, in brain injury, a lot of what we try to do, one of my favorite words, remit, is create a vision. Because again, it's not that they're gonna live the rest of their life necessarily. Once they come in the front door, it's not like, welcome to the rest of your life. It's like, let's figure out what's going on and where else you can go. And sometimes we have 90 days to do that, and that's all we have. Sometimes, depending upon the nature of the injury, I didn't wanna talk about funding a lot because that would take up time. But sometimes there are lifelong funding streams. Sometimes there's very finite and time-limited funding streams. And all those things have to guide and direct our actions in some contingent way, as we would appreciate. So we have to have a vision. Because especially if someone's gonna leave, our place might be the one-stop shop for an intensive, comprehensive, integrated neurobehavioral treatment, and that's it. And then they're gonna go home to a local outpatient clinic, which maybe does hips and shoulders and back and neck, and they've never seen a person with a brain injury. Or even more remotely, home health aides. You know, and they're really nice folks, right? That we, a lot of things we do wouldn't be possible without them but they're typically not trained clinicians in traumatic brain injury, right? So this vision's gotta make sense. And there's gotta be something that's organized and accessible, and that's what this is intended to be, this model. So again, with the backdrop of the four-term, we say, and sort of make it clear, 
We have to establish medical stability to some extent before we can proceed to teach and engage in a learning process. Now, they're not exclusive of one another, but the extent to which we do or don't establish medical stability is going to largely influence the extent to which we establish medical or behavior stability, and ultimately the extent to which we're able to help folks engage again in some stable activity plan. Now, this model to most of us here probably is like, right, we got it, that's easy, not rocket science. It's not supposed to be, right? So it's just a really, like, it's, it's just helped kind of like an organizational framework. It's based on the forward term, which I think is just awesome. And it's also, from an external side, it's a way for us to communicate very complex things, which we as behavior analysts are constantly pressed to do. Even by our own organization, a lot of recent ABAs have been about speak, speak our language to each other, but be nice to the other people. Like, talk in a language that's accessible to them. Make what we do make sense to people outside of our world. And that's what this model is intended to do from a, the complexity of dealing with neurobehavioral challenges and brain injury. Okay. So, now I talked a little bit about a lot of things, right, rather quickly, and I apologize for that due to time. But now the defining feature of recovery, and I've talked about this, awareness deficits, okay? And <clears throat> the fancy term for an awareness deficit is anos agnosia. And it's a really fancy word to say a lack of knowledge about a deficit, all right? So it's like a blind spot. Somebody literally doesn't acknowledge that they've got a profound deficit. Now that can look like a couple of different forms. It can look like somebody falls and I say, well, you fell because they were toxic, which is like a motor movement disorder, and somebody wasn't there to help them transfer. And this guy who's lying on the floor will say, I was fine, the floor was wet. It's like, oh, okay. We've had people cook, uh, we do some trials sometimes where we have people make like mac and cheese, like the simplest thing you can do. Except that, you know, as I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm making sure it's safe, the water's evaporating, the noodles are drying out, the cheese is in and it's, it's just awful. And then it's smoking and I eventually run and turn the stove off and I say, so what happened? And this guy says, oh, I've never cooked on this stove before. And I've never seen that pot before, so. And I think, did you listen to the timer that went off? I, I've never seen that timer before. I mean, literally. It's just, they just don't agree. They don't see it, they don't acknowledge it. There's a great article when, when, um, when I left Temple and we were, Heinlein started supporting site visits to Remen, uh, which I thought were great. And we had a lot of really good dialogues and I would always have clients come up because they're walking, talking adults and some of them really like to tell their story and some of it's terrifically made up. Um, and there's reasons why that's true. But for the same reasons I'm about to say this, there's an article by Sigurd Glenn, which is essentially about maladaptive tax. And, it's, and she, in there, she kind of starts to move into the direction of discriminating between whether someone's lying, like manipulatively, or they're just unable to tact accurately. And I think the distinction's critical in brain injury, because one's a skills deficit, the other one's kind of a motivational issue, using very general terms, right? So in brain injury, there's lots of reasons why both of those things would be important. Because if somebody says, oh, I fell because I wasn't safe and I didn't wait for somebody to come in and tra help me transfer, well, that might mean they are less likely to move to a different setting or maybe even get to go home. So that has a profound contingent impact on their behavior. So they have every reason to say, well, the freaking floor was wet. And I might curse, I should say, I should preface that, because we get cursed out a lot every day, and it's kind of part of our language, and I apologize in advance if I drop a couple gems. But then there's also reasons why someone with a terrific brain injury might just be unable to describe their situation accurately. So that's an important difference. So how do they talk about awareness in this? I hope this shows up okay. In the brain injury community. Generally denotes a reduced, a reduced ability to praise one's strengths and weaknesses. Pretty straightforward. Generally operationalizes the degree of agreement between subjects and ratings by clinicians or others. So we do a lot of rater co-rater stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in one of the case studies to try to like look for agreement. This is kind of like a self-management model in some ways, right? <clears throat> And I, it's no surprise, studies have found greater agreement about the readily observable things versus the, what we would call private events, or things that are just a little more loose in terms of their descriptions, less quantitative. Uh, suffers from self-awareness after a severe TBI, loses the ability to make a real examination of their emotional status, of course. I think the last bullet's pretty interesting. So this is how they talk about awareness in the brain injury community. Because as I said, it, it's a hallmark feature, and it has quite a bit to do with eventual outcomes and progression for people 
Um, but few studies have examined the influence of the subject's ability to communicate their experience to others. Protect them. Can they describe? Can they describe anything? That's why, like that, you know, sort of uh, mac and cheese example I gave. We have people who take neuropsych tests, and it's lighting up with profound impairment. And they say, well, F you. Like, I sucked at tests my whole life. Like, I barely got through high school. I bombed my SAT, so why the hell would I do good on this? And this is like a guy telling me this. And I said, okay, you know, okay, I get it. So we put them in a, in a more of a functional situation, when we think they're more familiar with, maybe doing laundry, maybe doing mac and cheese kind of thing, something they've done before. And you want to see if, what's going to happen. You know, you put them in a less loaded situation where it's not as easy to explain away why they, you know, struggled with respect to the task at hand. And if the same thing pops up, they disagree, it sort of goes the way I described earlier, it's dangerous because you have somebody who then it's really difficult to engage because you're trying to engage them in a rehab and they're constantly saying, I, I, I just need to get the hell out of here. Why don't you shut the fuck up? I just got to get out of here, man. Give me the phone. I, I'm going to use the phone. I gotta call, I'm going to get a cab. I got to call my wife. I should be at work. I, this is what we deal with sometimes. And, and you're sort of like, at first you're dumbfounded and you're struggling because you're thinking, well, what do I do? How do I engage with this person who won't even acknowledge that they have a brain injury, let alone how it might be affecting their life? And I'm, I'm going to get into that. That's just a little foreshadow. But that's what life is like sometimes, for them and for us. So in the behavior analytic community, there are mentions of awareness, but for obvious reasons, there's not a tremendous amount of research about it. Right? It's a really mercurial, abstract, qualitative thing to talk about. Um, so, right, and this is right from the, you know, Matthew Skinner, a difference between behaving and reporting that one is behaving, or reporting the causes of one's behavior, right? In arranging conditions under which a person describes a public or private world in which he lives, a community generates that very special form of behavior called knowing. If anybody's read Heinlein's paper on when you speak of knowing, if I'll have a beer with you one night, you can tell me what it means, because I'm still trying to figure that out. <clears throat> Anyhow. We do try to use some of these thinkings that go back a ways. This is not new stuff. This is, I think, I think it was science and human behavior. Um, but then there's Dermot Barnes Holmes, right? Who came from sort of the Steve Hayes school, and that stuff like RFT relational frame that gets way out there, right? Way they really they they've done some brilliant stuff, some funky stuff, but some really brilliant stuff that I think is we borrowed some from it, not necessarily RFT but some of their ideas about how to kind of get at this awareness construct, this awareness idea. Um, so again, as he would, as Dermot Barn Holmes says in, in Human Self-Awareness, the person is not simply behaving with regard to his behavior, but is also behaving verbally with regard to his behavior. So the difference between nonverbal and verbal behavior is critical. And again, we as BAs are equipped to engage in this kind of work. Because if you think about someone with an awareness deficit, as a candidate for what a typical psychologist might do or a neuropsychologist might do to try to enlighten them about their deficits or inform or educate them about their deficits and then help them adjust and accept and cope and move ahead, we don't see those people. You know, they go to outpatient. If they're able to say yes and sit and talk nicely, they typically don't come in our door. So we deal with people who have great difficulty with some of the things I'm talking about here. So, but that doesn't mean we're not still mining for awareness in the midst of the work we might otherwise be trying to do to change behavior because there is such a thing in our world as behavior change without awareness, right? And then we're going to talk about that. So, and the last thing here is an alternative approach is to view the verbal self-report, presumably under discriminative control of characteristics or actions of the person making the report, as behavior subject to the same fundamental influences on the other, in contingencies, right? So we know we can subject nonverbal and verbal behavior to contingencies, and that sometimes is built into what we do, and again, I'll talk about that in one of the case studies. So this is a slide we developed to kind of bridge the gap between what the brain injury community calls awareness and talks about as awareness, and what we talk about as self-management, right? And I'm not necessarily gonna move down the vein that we're accustomed as behavior analysts in talking in terms about self-management, because this slide actually comes from a lot of my BI work. Um, so, but there are some, I think, in interesting and important parallels with respect to somebody's level of awareness and how good of a self-manager they are. So this, this, um, these three levels, intellectual, emergent, and anticipatory, came back in the mid to late 80s. Uh, this fellow by the name of Crossan did some studies because again, as we saw in the early slide about TBI statistics, pardon me, people were beginning to survive more injuries 
And so these residual features were more prominent, more prevalent. All of a sudden there were just more people and they were surviving more injuries. So these awareness deficits were a bigger problem. So they began to categorize them very, very broadly as deficits of awareness that are intellectual, emerging, or anticipatory. So an intellectually, someone with an intellectual level of awareness from a brain injury standpoint, means that they can say that they had a brain injury, but they don't know how it affects their life. So yes, I was in a car accident. It was terrible. I, I think I was in the hospital, but I don't remember how long. I know I came here, but I don't know when I got here or how long I've been here, but I know I have a brain injury. That's intellectual awareness. So they need a lot of help. Then there's emergent, which is people can acknowledge, obviously it's a progression from intellectual. So they can acknowledge that they have a brain injury. They know in the moment when they're struggling that it's their injury that's affecting that. And back to the BI slide, it's most obvious in physical ways. Maybe they're using an ambulation device or they're having some difficulty moving, uh, or in more subtle ways they're having trouble completing some kind of task or sequence, and they're able to say, man, this brain injury, just that kind of thing. And then there's the holy grail, which is anticipatory which is not only do they know they have a brain injury, they know when it's happening uh, and it's causing problems, but they can anticipate when they're gonna encounter those problems, right? I've never met one of those people. Okay, we, we as a matter of fact, I, I should put a little elevator in this slide because most of them are down below. They, we call them anti-intellectual. They just, they don't have a brain injury. And I don't have any business in their life. I don't have any business telling them what to do. I'm their kid's age or whatever, so, they're not even there. They're not even able or ready to acknowledge that they have a brain injury. So drawing from that, from a self-management side, and some of the case I'm, the case I'm going to present, anticipatory folks are pretty good self-managers. We can teach them a plan, teach them about the deficits and their strengths, give them a nice plan, kind of work through it with them in different contexts, acquire, right, establish behaviors, work generalization across different situ situations, and because they're motivated, you know, maybe intrinsically or extrinsically by getting home, or maybe getting back to some kind of job, or being a parent again, or some kind of spouse again in their household, they work that plan. Okay, so that's great. Again, I don't know any of those, or I can count them on one hand that I've met. They're all outpatients. Then there's this middle ground, where people get that they have an injury, they get they need help, but they don't know when it's going to happen. So we call that co I call that kind of co-management. Right? They need a buddy. Everybody needs a buddy, right? So they need a buddy, but they can they're willing to follow rules and routines and rhythms, right? Follow the prescription. And we get there sometimes. And sometimes, you know, we get there without awareness, and that's different. That's much more complicated. But that's one of the cases I'll present. But there are folks who get it, but just always need that help. And that comes probably in one of those other slides of the continuum I described in one of those settings. Maybe even at home, ideally. And then there's people down here who need somebody to lead. You know, they, they can't do it. They can't be out there and look at something and say, oh, right, and do this. Or like at Remed in the middle, this would be probably like a supported apartment situation. You know, you can leave somebody alone for a little bit. They're not going to go into the community and do something unsafe. They're not going to call 911 when they're upset. You know, they're not going to take some, they're not going to buy weed off the neighbor or something like that, like some of our guys do. They're not going to do that stuff, all right? We don't have neighbors that sell weed. That didn't sound right. But we have had people that do home visits bring substances in because substance abuse is a big part of what we deal with. Right? That's a big problem in brain injury, whether before or following injury. Um, so then there's other management. And again, for someone who doesn't have awareness and any acknowledgement whatsoever, even at an intellectual level, that's really complicated when they need somebody to kind of like provide guidelines and rules and, and structure. So having said quite a bit rather quickly, um, about brain injury, but again, trying to be, at, at the sake of depth, going for scope and breadth um, about sort of what this population looks like and how they arrive at this and how we begin to treat, particularly from the clinical side as being analysts. I do want to kind of use this, pivot off this awareness feature to talk about these case studies, because really I think that, as I, as I jokingly remarked, the people that have awareness about their injury typically progress in a more fluid way. They might still need our level of support in the beginning because they have maybe really complicated medical features or they have profound medical or physical needs and they need an environment where there's a lot of intensity across the day. But as they become increasingly aware, they then move through that continuum and they, as I described in that sort of slide with the, that, that sort of bent arrow, uh, that arc, 
you know, they become aware of when they need help and how they need help and why they need help. And therefore, that generates compliance, right? And don't we all love compliance? And that's a good thing. It comes more naturally as a part of this process of quote unquote healing or recovering. However, for some, these awareness deficits are profound and refractory to any sort of natural healing process or even any kind of otherwise rehab process. So those people wind up in trouble in some way. Maybe even at home, um, maybe in the community, certainly at work if they've even tried to get back to work. And so they wind up at our door and we have to figure out what to do. Okay. Not just to make not just to help them, but also sometimes just to keep our setting safe, which again, many of you probably have that same kind of dual mission. How do we help this person? But how do we keep everybody else safe while we're doing it? So I've got three case studies that I think, you know, sort of nicely broadly represent the spectrum of how the philosophy, principles, and procedures of behavior analysis are applied. Okay? And again, really reminding ourselves that it's the full complement of the four term. I just had a great discussion with Samantha, Samantha, who came up to me at the break and mentioned to me, hey Chris, I've got this kid that engages in a lot of head banging. Like, what do you think's happening when he's banging his head? After that sort of slide I showed him, I said, well, it's probably not great, obviously, that's the, the right answer. Right? So, okay, so what is happening? Well, that's a concussive event. We now know, as a society, we know a lot more about the immediate effects of that concussive event. And I, I think Samantha beat me to it by saying, is that an EO? And I said, well, yeah. Like, it's an organic change. Something's happening. There's some sort of change, right, from striking your head in a forceful way against this static object, especially if it's a wall or something like that, you're concussed. And if you, you're running trials, and I get it, we're BC-oriented and ABC-oriented, but what I left bewildered about, but really interested in is, how does the EO fit into that? You know, what should, what should you do? Because back to the Sammy Capitan video, you wouldn't throw him back on the ice. You know, if anybody ever, actually, uh, there was a great PBS documentary, Frontline documentary, called League of Denial. And that preceded this, uh, did anybody see that show of hands? Anybody see League of Denial? It was fantastic, all right? And they had the agent, I'm taking up time for the case stage, this is a great story, and it's contemporary because it's about to Super Bowl. They had the agent lead for Troy Aikman, Lee Steinberg, and they interviewed him. And he was talking about an NFC championship game that Troy Aikman was playing in, and of course he was out. And Troy got hurt. He got blasted by one of the, probably Charles Haley from the Niners, right? Blasted. Troy left the game. So Lee left the game to go see Troy, who was at that point in an ER, right? In a dark room, in the triage room, curtains closed, lights out. Lee goes in to see him and says, hey Troy, how are you? I'm good, man, what are you doing here? Oh, I just came from the game. Oh, the game, what game? The football game. Oh, how'd we do? Did we win him, did we lose? He had no recall. Steinberg left, did something else, came back. Hey Lee, how you doing? I'm good, Troy, how are you? I'm great, what are you doing here? Come see how you're doing for you. Lost track of the game again. Had no recall of the game. And that's and then they interview Steve Young, right? Who some of you may know, famous quarterback from not famous from the Tampa Bay Buck days, but famous from the Niner days. He says about the CTE thing, he said, I mean, this was candid and, and powerful. He said, I feel like I've got a ticking time bomb in my head. Like I don't know when this is gonna hit. I've been and, and then they showed some clips of Steve Young sustaining some unbelievable hits. And he said, and then Steve Young's a guy with a law degree, a real well-regarded guy, and he just said, I don't know what the rest of my life is going to look like. And this is after they've told stories about like Junior Seau and some of these famous ball players that have committed suicide, had these terrific mood disorders that have you know, resulted in really awful things in their lives and their families' lives as a result of this kind of symptom process. And I guess I'm heading out in that part of the sphere just to bring it back to this discussion about EOs and concussions to say they're real. And there's like a good neurochemical level of that uh, that doesn't resolve as immediate as some of the other symptoms do. Right? So just food for thought. I thought that was just a provocative discussion, which I'm always happy that these talks are in a bi-directional kind of way. All right. So I'll shut up about that. So case studies. Okay, so again, I'll be brisk here because I want to keep the time. So our first case study here is Sarah. Sarah had an acquired brain injury. Sarah had MS. She was diagnosed with MS in 1988, the age of 27. She was in the Navy at the time. She started to lose some level of function and was diagnosed through a series of evaluations. So she was service, you know, she was funded by the VA. 
Um, she lived independently in the community, somewhat local to here. She raised a son with MS, okay? So at this point with MS, she's living like lots of people do with MS. In the community, successful, independent. She was a Penn, master's level Penn graduate. Father was a physician. I mean, she comes from a, a really well-educated and established family background. So she raised a son in this home with MS. She was driving in the community, um, and that was going well. Actually, her son graduated from high school while she was living with us, which is sort of a little anachronistic to my story, but uh, we took her to her son's graduation. That was a really cool thing. Really effortful, but really cool. So, however, there were some significant changes, functional changes and cognitive changes, following some experimental therapy that she did to try to improve her walking in 2010. And her son told me the story. Who's, her son's now about 21 or 2. And he said, because I said to him, I said, listen, when did this like change occur? Like, it was just when she got to us, uh, which I'm sort of jumping ahead here, but when she got to us, it was like she was on fire. It was crazy. Like she was screaming and yelling and sliding out of a chair and calling the cops. And I was like, what the hell is happening? However, I knew that she had raised this kid who was pretty capable and she had lived independently. I'm like, how did this happen? How do you, there's no real great data about MS that says you go from this to this, like in a year or less. There isn't. And he described the story to me about this drug story, which helped her walk. Uh, for a little while, better than she was, and that was the intention, but then had this aftermath. And there's not like a big class action suit or any kind of legal thing going on about all this, but that was his hypothesis about why this change occurred. So what happened, there was a functional decline, confusion, memory impairment, adverse behaviors, falls, agitational movement. This was still happening while she was living on her own. Her son was now, had actually moved out with another family because things at home got dicey. She had a home health aides coming into her house. At one point in time, she had called 911 150 times in 30 days because she had fallen. When I met her, I said, Sarah, that's a lot of calls. And she said, well, Chris, I've got this lifelike thing, the lifeline thing that my dad gave me. He said, whenever I fall, I should press it. I said, okay. And I said, well, what did the police say when they showed up? She said, well, they would help me get up and ask me why I fell, and I'd tell them why, and it was always for some reason. It was the chair, the aide didn't set the chair up right, or the board was slippery. It wasn't like she ever tried to do it in an unsafe way, back to the mac, back to the mac and cheese. So she was mac and cheese, and I'm thinking, all right. And then she said, and you know what, Chris, they had the audacity to do? And I said, what, sir? She said, they had the audacity to start fining me for calling me. I said, oh. I said, uh, so why would they do that? She said, they wanted my money. And I said, you live in a really affluent township, which she did. I said, did you ever think they were finding you to get you to stop calling them? She said, no. But I don't think that's why they were finding me. So she was really, again, from an awareness side, this is important, sensitivity contingencies. That's our wheelhouse. This woman was being fined hundreds of dollars, I, I suppose, by the fire department, police department, every time she called 911. Well, then she started calling 911 to accuse the aides that were working with her of stealing things from her. Okay? So, deteriorating, essentially. She was psychiatrically admitted in 2013, and then she went to an acute rehab facility where these behaviors persisted. So, she was eloping from the acute rehab facility, screaming and yelling, crying in a power wheelchair. Because um, she was, I forgot to say, she's in a power wheelchair uh, as a result of the MS. So again, and that's as you can look at through the lens of acquired brain regions, neurologic impact, and impairment. So all of this resulted, the rehab hospital didn't know what the hell to do, and they called us and we said, we'll, we'll see if we can figure it out. So there were some complica <laughs> complications. Um, so we had to uh, you know, admit her for stabilization, but she clearly, she was adamant that all we needed to do was put her back in her apartment, that this was, I mean, she used, and she could, dress you down with the most elegant language you'd ever heard here without an utterance of profanity. It was really pretty impressive, actually. Um, luckily, funding, well, funding was available for her to come in, but not for long-term agreement. Um, so this is where some of these other features of these cases are compounding. Um, nursing home was available through funding stream, but our goal was to try to see if we could put her back together and get her back home, or maybe even some other rehab-based setting. Not to mention that the medical and behavioral instability that she demonstrated or presented with uh, was a significant factor related to candidacy for anywhere but us. So she was really scary, everybody else. Like I said, she was, uh, I'll get into the, I guess that next year. All right, so again, what we do oftentimes in the beginning of these family meetings, they come in, we're in our conference room, which is, you know, smallish, 10, 12 seats. 
And they're like, we don't know what to do. They're exasperated. Sometimes they're tearful. Sometimes they're angry. They're always confused and really just exhausted and concerned. So I, we have like these indelible triangles on some of the whiteboards where we put that triangle up and start mapping out what's happening. Okay, so from a medical side, what do we have to get at? And this is how we start to kind of organize this thing visually, but also conceptually and theoretically from the standpoint of the forward term, right? That's in my back pocket when we're having these discussions. And then who is it, and this kind of pulls in this interdisciplinary team component, who's treating these things? And these are the people that we have available. So we have a neuropsychiatry that comes once a week, He's also our, you know, he's, he's the guy we go to. Physiatry, that's our medical director. Is a physiatrist, like a physical medicine doctor. I don't know if you guys have physiatrists or not, but they're physical medical doctors, PM and R docs. They live in like, you know, Bryn Mawr Rehab and Moss and McGee and stuff. We were lucky enough to have some pen guys. Neurology, of course, um, nursing and neurology, because she was, you know, with MS, part of her MS feature was she had to self cath and self disimpact. So to bowel, uh, avoid bowel or bladder, she had to do that manually, digitally. So that was, a, and she had done that successfully, independently on her own for, you know, 10 years, almost 15 years, until this profound change occurred, maybe 20 years. And then all of a sudden, that was a big problem. Wasn't sleeping, um, hydration was a big deal. She was very aware that overhydrating herself would result in needing to use the bathroom, or God forbid, an episode of incontinence. And her and her stature or thinking about herself would not bear the thought of being incontinent. That would be a terrible embarrassing of someone of her status. So that was something she really did not, and she, she, the result was she underhydrated. Uh, and at one point, I'll get into this, we had a, we had a whole like 38 page, not quite. Uh, sun protocol, because when it got hot out, she melted like a popsicle outside. And that wasn't just a problem from a hydration side, that became a problem from an MS side. I don't know if anybody knows anything with MS. But sun and overheating and under hydration can be, can be a horrific exact, exacerbator of MS symptoms. Uh, and positioning and skin, power chair, limited mobility, paralysis, can't reposition very well. That's really important with respect to skin care and skin chain, uh, you know, uh, integrity. Uh, there was profound memory impairment, verbal aggression, but of the really sort of nice old lady sort, if you will. Um, elopement, which is not something you would think about from a woman in her 50s with MS in a power chair, but she would try to barrel down the driveway if she had a shot at it. Uh, falls, sliding out of her chair was her, you know, and if you got in front of her chair and kind of said, hey, wait a minute, she'd have a problem pulling the arm of her chair up and like flopping out of the side. It was, it was dangerous at times. Lots of threats and demands and calls to 911, which became fairly constant at one point. Um, we're very friendly with the Malvern police uh, for these reasons. Um, and mood lately, a lot of tearfulness, a lot of emotionality, some of which can come with MS or even what's now known as like PBA or pseudobulbar, or pseudobulbar, pseudobulbar affective disorder, uh, which can be a, you know, sort of a feature of MS or other kinds of neurologic syndromes. But it comes with like a, you know, uh, an affective disorder. Okay, what else is coming? So these are the people, so psychologists, the analysts, right, of course, PT, neuropsychology's in there. She would not allow a neuropsych assessment to evaluate her deficit areas. She was perfectly adamant that she was perfectly fine. And we were just nothing but a bother. She needed to get the hell out of our place, get back to an apartment, get in the car, raise her son, as she had done for all of her life, and want nothing more to do with us. Uh, and that was challenging. So no insight, not an inch. Uh, unstable community engagement, she had been kicked out of her hair salon, she had been kicked out of the library, she had been kicked out of all these places, and if you asked her why that all occurred, she would tell you it's because those people weren't very nice. Not because she had cried, or not paid somebody, or been unreasonable, or looked really unsafe moving around, and they just said, please don't come back. It was for none of those reasons. Uh, no access to driving, I can't imagine her behind the wheel of a car, sitting her behind the wheel of a chair, but she had driven for most of her life. Uh, limited activity, participation. Um, she really wouldn't engage in the things we were offering because she felt they were very beneath her. And then there's these folks doing something to care. So when we brought Sarah in, and it was really, I mean, in a 24 hour way, she was screaming and throw, you know, sort of like writhing at night in her bed um, with, with some level of kind of like nighttime delusional kinds of behavior that was disrupting her sleep. She was under hydrating during the day. She was in crisis throughout the course of the day, whether it was trying to elope or call 911 or slide out of her chair. She was really disruptive to the milieu, and it was problematic. Um, so we really felt strongly, back to the EO and the OEB sort of triangle organization of things, 
that there need, she was on no medications, that she needed something maybe from a, I didn't get into the medications, but I'll sort of touch on that through these case studies. The typical standard kind of ways we approach medications are looking for a mood stabilizer, looking for an atypical antipsychotic to help enhance frontal lobe function. Um, and then only typically after those things were on board, would there be something like an SSRI or an antidepressant? Because without those prior meds I mentioned, you really run the risk of overactivating somebody that could get dangerous or just really unstable, or for the manic, which we certainly experienced. So those features are really important. Stimulants can be really dangerous. Obviously, there's reasons if you test that attention and it looks poor, and they you know, have some sort of post-injury ADHD or ADD features, it would make sense to kind of step ahead to uh, stimulants. But again, you're stimulating a brain that's impaired. And that might potentiate many things. It stimulates not just attention. It stimulates lots of things, right? It comes as like a package. Um, and sometimes that's really dangerous. But Sarah came in the door on nothing. So there was a strong belief that an atypical would be the best thing to go for here because it's going to treat a little bit of the mood instability, but it's also going to help with some of this inflexibility of thinking, I guess is a way to say it, her inability or unwillingness to kind of give on any of these other descriptions of her own behavior. We thought there might be some movement there. And we've had experience also with atypicals, and I'm, I'm not in any way an MD or anything like that or medically trained, but just from clinical experience. Um, we also felt like it might help with this emotional ability, which was making it difficult to have conversations with her or interact with her in an ongoing way. But we knew if we offered this or suggested this or made this recommendation from a, you know, an SD side, we would provoke her on again with her. There'd be no way she would agree to a medication. So again, looking at all four terms of the contingency, I sort of said, well, we could try something with contingencies. She was really demanding to go to the library, to go to the park. She just wanted to get out of the house. And I said, look, why don't we just try this? Why don't we just say if she doesn't call 911 and doesn't slide out of her chair and doesn't engage in disruptive behavior, then we'll go to the park three times a week and we'll take date on this. So we developed the daily schedule for her, which I'll show in a prior hand in a subsequent slide. Um, and we had yes, no questions in there, like did these things happen? They were largely for our data purposes because she denied all of it. But if she met criteria, meaning low rates or no rates, so we ran some differential reinforcement, right, of these behaviors, and she met criteria, then she could access the community. Because otherwise the community would be a really unsafe proposition. And despite the fact that we hadn't treated the EOs that I really felt like we needed to treat first to get some stability in this contingency sensitivity behavior, we got it. So, this is what happened. So this is her coming in the door. Now, she wasn't too upset in the beginning because these black dots here are requests and attempts to toilet. So as I said, she came in self-capping, self-disimpacting, right? That's how she forwarded down water. So she was making all these requests, as many as 35 a day, to use the toilet. And in the beginning, when she came in, we were baselining. We complied. Okay, let's go. Rarely produced, but said relentlessly that she had to go. Okay, so we just sort of, let's figure out, let's get some baseline data. And obviously that's unbelievably excessive. Right? Some of these are even including like overnight data. So this is, we're looking at this time, mood instability here, and then on the secondary access, requested attempts in crisis. So these uh, red circles, red closed circles, are mood instability, okay? So that didn't happen yet, and I'll tell why. That'll make sense in a second. And nor did these open squares and triangles, which represent uh, crisis behaviors. Okay, so calls to 911 and a rope or sliding out of chair. That came next after we did something, which was we instituted a schedule. So this is all over the place, all day long, interrupting her therapy, engagement, and rehab program, as well as everything else in the house, because she takes one or two people to help her get onto the toilet safely. So when we instituted this schedule. This is what happened. She became much more emotional, as you can imagine. It makes sense. Why, why on God's earth, Chris, would you ever have to tell me when I have to go to the bathroom, or when I can and when I can't? And when we started to try to talk about the need for structure, again, there's no awareness here. She was adamant that it was unnecessary. And it was, again, another reason why she shouldn't be here. So these things spiked up. We saw crisis behavior. We saw also attempts to, uh, so sorry, the, um, should have oriented me better this. These, uh, closed circles, as I said, are requests. These open squares are attempts, meaning she's barreling into the bathroom trying to get herself on the toilet. And the open triangles are the crisis behavior. So that change in her structure and schedule precipitated quite a bit of upset. So that continued. 
and it was really problematic, as you can see. We're talking about episodes of mood instability, and then we did that through like a Likert rating. Again, some of it's qualitative. It's not very clean, and I get that, because I, you know, having grown up at Temple and around Heinlein, I, I know what we're going for, but I also know where we're working, so we're trying to make those things uh, work together as best as possible. But there's a lot of instability here. So this is where we came into this discussion to say, what do we do about this? And we had this discussion about EOs and, and, and consequences, and we went for it. So we introduced this DRO procedure that I talked about. And so what we got kind of rather immediately was some suppression came back, right? Some suppression of the crisis. That got her into the community, contacted the contingencies a couple times. Okay, so maybe we've got something to go with here. And then what ensued was a pretty nice period of stability. Okay? So we got control over it. We talk again, we're talking about she still, her awareness has not changed. Her agreement about being where she is has not changed. So there's no change in awareness, but we're getting behavior change. Right? So back to that sort of colloquialism, behavior change without awareness. We were moving in that direction. But we're still getting this mood lability. So I started to have sessions with Sarah where I was talking to her about her success getting into the community, and I was actually showing her these data in a, well, obviously a more accessible way. Because she's a, you know, Ivy League girl. So I'm saying, okay, so let's meet you where you are intellectually and let's talk about data, right? So I started to say, look, Sarah, despite the fact that you've, you're less in crises, that's good, that's progress, you're still really emotionally unstable. You're still crying a lot. You're having difficulty kind of controlling your emotions. That's affecting our ability to help you. And I was, she didn't believe my word, but she gave some credence to the data, which I respected her for. <laughs> and then again, persisted here. We're a couple of months out from her admission. But these things are still popping, but overall kind of settling in, which was nice. But we still really felt like for a longer term effect and benefit for her, this medication intervention was going to be necessary. So we introduced one milligram of risperdal. Okay. Now, currently, this is this is like two or three years ago. Currently, it's more often that we'll go for something like Seroquel, from an atypical. We we'll get to specifics a little bit. Risperdal and Geodon, some of the other atypicals, can have some kind of, they sometimes have EPS or extra pyramidal syndrome effects. And for folks with any kind of movement issues or disorders, those can be exacerbated sometimes, not always, by atypicals. So Risperdal was the safest of those at the time. Seroquel now is a little more preferred. Uh, plus it helps if you give it at night, kind of QHS, it can help with sleep. And there's an XR formula for it, which is nice extended release, and that's been pretty effective, and people will tolerate higher doses. Now, just to dig another layer down, for the dosing for Seroquel, I know for sort of in a schizophrenic or a really psychiatric population, sometimes it gets four, six, and up a day. We're, we're living in kind of the one to two world, because our neuropsychiatrists would say, look, for the purposes of frontal lobe enhancement, which is what we're going for, a little will do generally as much as a lot. So we're not kind of moving up in dosing. Now, with Seroquel, it's a little bit different because sometimes that can be a sort of a little bit of a hybrid of a mood stabilizer, so sometimes the dosing will go up on that. I don't, I don't know how many folks are involved in this sort of that part of it. But again, I hope what we're walking, people are walking away from what this talk is, it's an EO. Right? It's got to be part of our thinking. It's got to be part of our conceptualization. We have to factor in for somehow these medications uh, and the changes that we need to put in. Okay, so we introduced Risperdal, and that's this is what we were going for, right? So all of a sudden, these episodes of mood instability decrease significantly. And I hope this slide shows up at a point. Sorry. Okay, so what this slide doesn't show that I want to make sure you hear about is what that got us. So what I had said to Sarah was, okay, so we got into the community in a limited way, in a time-limited way, in a structured way, because you're safer, you're not in crisis. But this mood lateability, this general mood instability, is preventing us from doing other things that you're asking about, like going to the gym, or going to swim, or going to get your hair cut. Because it could still contribute to escalation of mood and maybe a safety or a crisis issue. So once the Risperdal came on board and those red dots subsided, we added swimming, personal fitness trainer appointments, hair appointments, and we were woke, right? So back to that triangle that I presented earlier, that neurobehavioral philosophy, we were finally kind of touching all three corners of that. We had established a level of medical stability. We had better you know, scheduling. She was more compliant, as you can see through those other data, much more compliant with the self-cath and self-disimpact schedule. So that was helping move through the day a little bit. 
She was complying with the you know, redirectable around crises. So from a behavioral stability standpoint, we have better control over those high risk events, plus better control of day-to-day -day compliance. And she was mood stable back to the risk of all, moved us into the community more with her, generated what I would say was like a whole other level, so to speak, of stability for her. Because we finally got all three of those engines kind of running. Right? So that's where we're trying to get to. Um, and I think with Sarah, that was pretty effective. Now that didn't, the rest of the story is pretty convoluted after that, but it was awesome for a little while. Oh, let's talk about Fred. All right, so Fred <clears throat> suffered a work-related injury. Fred was a roofer. Fred was working on somebody's gutter. Fred fell off the roof at the age of 39. He had a wife. He'd been married for, I think at that point, 20 plus years. Um, had a couple of kids. Fred had a high GCS, so he had a mild TBI. Three-day acute rehab. Oh. So ER, acute rehab, because he didn't clear right away, looked good, they said you don't need to be here, they sent Fred home. Um, so also, the other thing that was interesting about Fred was his acute intervention involved managing DTs, which is like DTs from withdrawal, right? So alcohol withdrawal. So there was a suspicion that alcohol or some kind of substance might have been involved in his accident, but there was no way to confirm that. So he had an unsuccessful attempt to return to work in January, so like about six months later he tried to go back to work, or five months later, then he left the house for six months. And nobody knows where Fred went. He just disappeared. Now, he'd been a guy that camped and hiked with his kids, and they thought maybe that's where he went. He went out in the woods somewhere and lived on his own. He knew other people. Fred didn't tell anybody where he went, but luckily Fred came home. But when he came home, it was no better. There was a lot of instability, couldn't go back to work. He had unrelenting headaches, dizziness. So he had this vestibular slash cervicogenic headache issue, which is like headaches that radiate from sort of down the lower part of your skull and up into your neck. Some people get those positionally sometimes. Um, and they can radiate, and they can radiate all the way across the cranial area and become really arrested. Like people describe migraines, it's kind of like a migraine from the back, but one that can kind of, you know, permeate the other areas of the brain. It would just be a really intense experience. Dizziness, photophobia, seizure-like activity, so you have these kind of shuddering episodes, never a, a really full seizure, but this funky episode, irritable, depressed, and sleep deprived. So what he was doing at home, he was living at home, he was going to the doctor, he was saying he didn't feel good, they said they didn't know what to do, and then he went back home. And this went on for a while, because he didn't get to us until 2014. So he got hurt in 2012, left the earth for six months or something like that, and then for about a year and a half or two, lived at home in an unbelievably unsuccessful way. So then it came to remake. And that was through a case manager that we had that heard about remake at a conference, went up and talked to our clinician, it was, which has happened to me on a couple of occasions. People come and say, we've never heard about this, we don't know about you guys, where do you exist? And we start talking and the next thing you know, a referral's made and we've got somebody in the door that really needs help. Because again, otherwise, Fred's going to you know, he's not going to a specialized neurobehavioral intense treatment center. He's going to his PCP. He's telling his PCP he doesn't feel good. And he's telling his neurologist, or the PCP says, go see the brain guy, the neurologist. The neurologists are great docs, but they don't always all specialize very much in brain injury, believe it or not, right? And that's not to disparage neurology whatsoever. Just to say that it's, it just doesn't stand to reason that you go to the brain doc and they, they make it make it all make sense. So there were some, again, complications with Fred. So he came to remit in January of 2015. Again, he was not close to us, so it was a little bit of a distance, which was really hard for him. His kids were like adult kids, but they were really scared for their dad because they knew it wasn't looking good. And he had been, I think, the bottom of that slide, I missed, he had been suicidal. Not attempt, but statements uh, with ideation. So a complexity request was made. We requested for 90 days. They said we could have 30 at a time. So we were in a little bit of a dogfight with the funder. And that happens from time. It's not cheap. Um, so the low end rate where the site I work at can be five, six, seven hundred a day. High end is twelve, fifteen hundred a day. So we're talking about you know twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a month uh, for care. So it's not cheap, and there's reasons why people would say, well, they don't need all that. You know, can we do that at home? Can we buy that a la carte from an outpatient site? Well, sure, but it's probably not going to work. And after a couple, Fred didn't sustain this, but other people sustain psychiatric admissions arrests, incarcerations, and then somebody finally says, well, we spent 60000 at this point. We could have just done it in two. So it starts to make a little more sense to people, unfortunately, for the wrong reasons, but nonetheless.
So despite limited treatment over two years, uh, we had to appeal for 30 more days after the first 30. We eventually got 60 and then he had to go. So I'll go through this part pretty quickly. So this triangle thing again, I'm, this is just a useful exercise because I'm using it to demonstrate how we bring, so Fred's wife came with him. She was sobbing in the meeting we were having. Fred was sobbing and it's really hard to see adults that are trying to make this thing work and loved each other and raised a family, just not know what the hell happened. And so this really sometimes slows it down for them and starts to organize it visually a little bit and then gives us a path to follow, right? And for them to monitor. And more importantly, because we only had 60 days with Fred, which felt like 20 minutes, it gives them something to follow when they leave. This is the vision part I talked about. So, okay, so here's the triangle. We're gonna get to this much and a little bit of this, but you guys, you gotta keep moving. Right, so we educate the families. If there's a funder or a case manager, we'll educate them. If there's another team to pick up on the other end, we'll educate them. So we sort of terminology, and this is maybe we're sitting, but try to write the book for somebody. It's not gonna get rid of someone else. Right? They might see an OT, they might see a PT, and there's some great people out there. But on their own, this is, this is Herculean to try to do all of this. But if they have a prescription to follow that we give them, with, give them when they leave, it's really helpful. It's like kind of breadcrumbs on a trail or marks on a tree, right? So again, this is, as I showed for Sarah, this was Fred's array of symptoms. He had vestibular, which you might've picked up on already, sleep disruption, med changes, pain, fatigue. So when Fred first came in, I, I went to meet with Fred and I got about eight minutes in and he shut his eyes. Not because he couldn't stand me, he, he was just in unbelievable pain. So my session was over. Then he needed to go sit in his room for two hours with the lights out. Okay, that's gonna slow things down. And the clock is ticking in the back of my head, but that's all he can tolerate. Sometimes we've had guys, I can't even wear gingham plaid shirts to work. I prefer gingham plaid sometimes, but you can't because it's too visually stimulating. Or we have to have room darkening sheets and you have to come in and you have to talk really quietly. And you talk for 10 minutes and you leave for 20 minutes. And you come back in and talk for 10 minutes and then leave again. So we, and this is all from my standpoint, managing EOs. And that's where a lot of these session formats come from. So look, if we go in and we blow this guy out, we lose three hours. If we feel, even though we're not going to get much done, if we just do it incrementally, we preserve his capacity to engage. And that's assuming there's willingness. And that's, those are different things as we know. Okay, so again, couldn't go back to work, limited tolerance, property destruction at home, not with us. He was very happy to be at Remote, which is not, not common enough. But he really wanted help. He really wanted help. He knew it wasn't working. He didn't want to lose his wife. He didn't want to lose his kids. Wasn't sure if he could go back to work. But he just knew what was happening was dangerous. So with Fred, this is where we engage. Fred got it. He didn't have anticipatory awareness. He had emergent awareness. He could tell you he had a brain injury. He could tell you it wasn't working. He could tell you when it wasn't working, but he couldn't tell you when it was gonna happen again. And he did, certainly didn't know what to do about it when it was happening. So with Fred, we use this thing that I sort of cobbled together from behavior analysis, right? Called an escalation chain. And it's comprised of two primary parts, right? Self-monitoring and self-regulating. So you gotta be paying attention to what's going on, and then you have to know what to do accordingly. So from a self-monitoring standpoint, we're talking to people about, okay, so what is happening? What are you experiencing, right? What variables are, are involved that we need to monitor? Consider changes in intensity over time. So Fred says he has a headache, okay? So what's the worst headache feel like? What's the beginning of a headache feel like? And start to try to like teach discrimination, right? Repertoires of discriminating the intensity of headaches to try to say it's not like all of a sudden the onset of this arresting, profound, shutdown headache occurs. People come in saying, Chris, it feels like it goes from zero to 100 in the middle. I get it. What's the first thing that happens? What's the second thing that happens? It's trying to establish some kind of like, you know, timeline or temporal scale, if you will. And if possible, as much as it's reliable, include both private and public events. So I'm asking Fred, what's your wife saying to you? What are your kids doing? What's happening in the house? How loud is it? Who's home? And then I'm saying, how are you feeling? Man, that's a funky question, right? Because I, I don't know how, I don't know if we're asking these comments. I, I can't experimentally, you know, assess those things, but I have to try to go with it. Then from the self-regulation side, what do you do when those things happen? Okay, sometimes we're gonna include independent events and sometimes it's gonna be, what can somebody else help you do? It usually bounces in and that makes it look cool. So anyway, this is literally the worksheet that I use. So I showed Fred, Okay, we're gonna, go. we're gonna stretch this out. Down here, you can't see this, but this is a time scale. It could be seconds, minutes, hours. It's different on an individual basis. But I'm trying to help them, again, discriminate temporally, intensity, or changes in either their private or public events. 
then I'm also then correlating that with if things go along in time, they're going to go up in intensity if you don't do something about it. If you don't pay attention to your headache and it starts and you stay in an argument with your wife, what's going to happen in 10 minutes? What's going to happen in an hour? In 10 minutes, you're going to be screaming. In an hour, you might have put three holes in the wall with your fist. That has to slow down. And either your wife has to be the first one to say, Fred, you look like you're in pain. Well, Fred, you need to be able to say, my name head hurts. i got to stop. Like, that's what we're trying to get at. That's the self-management sort of crux of this. Can we teach them through this tool to pay attention and tact public and private events in a more accurate way? And in a way that's sensitive to their situation, both with respect to time and, you know, changes organically or environmentally. So it's not for everybody, right? You have to have some hardware uh, to be able to do this stuff. But for Fred, it worked really, really well. It was pretty effective, and he bought in. And he also had a pretty rich vernacular with which to describe to me what was happening. So he, the first session, he just starts saying all kinds of things to me, and I start saying, I'm going to I start saying to Fred, all right, slow down, Fred. Tell me, about, tell me more about this. Tell me more about that. Oops. So we did that. And this is what it looked This is busy. Right? So I said, Fred, what, what, what do you feel like when you're when everything's fine? What's it feel like? How would you describe that? Well, a normal headache. So he's giving me like a private event. Like what's happening organically, right? Or privately. And what's happening in the environment? Well, I'm hanging with my kids. I'm happy, right? Just hanging out. And I've been now Fred had a normal headache. He never had a day without a headache from his injury since his injury. So the normal headache is not banging, not twanging, not pissing him off. It's not interrupting what he's doing, so he's fine. So that was a zero for Fred. I said, okay, so if that's what's happening, and you're, you know, what are you doing about that? Well, just enjoy, feel good, right? So do, you don't do anything, just feel good, but pay attention. So again, the top of these steps, or parts of this chain, are the tacting self-monitoring, what's happening events. The bottom is what should I be doing about it, okay? The self-regulating. So one up the scale. You know, then Fred started wondering what's going wrong, what's going to go wrong today. Kind of this catastrophizing CBT in it a little bit. Started thinking something's going to go wrong, right? Things are getting harder, headache pain is getting worse. What eventually did we help Fred to do about that? He went down to the basement. He had a basement in his house, he had a tool shop set up down there. But the important thing to remember is when he's still down here, he can go use his tools. When he's up here, you don't want to put a wrench in Fred's hand. That could be dangerous. Or he's just not going to want to do it. Think about how you feel. If you go home and you're really exhausted, I mean, you're feeling good on the weekend, you got some downtime, think about your best day and your worst day. What you do on those days is really different, and how you manage how you feel really matters. Well, if you had to try to break that down for somebody who couldn't organize their life in that way, you might try to, I've tried to do it this way, right? And it's been a way that then we can not only try to teach these repertoires that have some level of directing, regulating activities associated with them, but we can also correlate with some kind of what we eventually call a mood rate. Because Fred can't carry this, carry this thing around, but he can't be like looking at this thing. It'd be like looking at a map and trying to drive at the same time. Like that's not going to work. So we had to start. This is the acquisition phase. We had to teach these repertoires. Right? We had to teach this describing repertoire to private events and public events. We had to teach it to his wife. She informed this list. Then we had to talk about what can you do right now and what can you learn to do. And not only what can you do, but what can other people do. So like right here, his wife will say, "Let it go." Sometimes it got beyond where Fred did something about it, and his wife would tell him. It was time for her. Listen, I, I've been married 18 years. You know, sometimes my wife says, okay, honey, enough. I said, okay, come out. That's how I stay married. Right? And then, as you can tell, the other thing is that I would stress or I do whenever I talk about these things, the higher up you go, the fewer options you have. Right? So when you really rip it and and some of our guys really get up there, where the pain gets really intense, the only thing they can do is leave the situation. They can't play cards, they can't read, they can't listen to music, they certainly can't work with tools. Lucky for Fred, his brother lived kind of down the street and around the corner. So Fred would just go there. Because typically these situations that got most intense were around his family or his wife and kids. So that the house wasn't working. And there was no, it was kind of like a rancher. So it was kind of like pacing and stuck and walls and doors and like no space. Fred needed space, right? I, I like to walk in the woods, it helps. Right. So that's an important, these are things, even though I've never been in Fred's house, 
We talked to his wife, talked to his adult kids, and tried to work this thing through. Is there a spot where I can go? Not really. Maybe the basement, but not at the top, only at the bottom of the scale, that is, okay? So this is how this kind of comes together. Now again, for Fred, carrying this thing around all day, it's, it's just too cumbersome. So what we eventually did, and this is kind of like a stim fading procedure, I guess, of sorts, is we worked that big old massive matrix down to a couple key phrases that Fred got. He knew these, essentially, were used to establish stim control, or you know, equivalents, with that big old chunky escalation chain. And this was a card that laminated, folded, folded in half, and laminated, and Fred carried it in his back pocket. And so he'd pull it out, we'd cue him to pull it out, he learned to pull it out independently, and he would look at it and say, when I feel, so it was like, when this happens, do this. It got short and sweet. And this is what he was gonna go home with. When I feel this, I do this. When I feel this, I do that. The other thing I forgot to mention about that mood rating scale is where you saw those numbers attributed to those different self-monitoring um, levels. We had Fred doing that on an hourly basis. We're talking acquisition, right? We know with acquisition, you need schedules of reinforcement or some training levels. And this isn't DTI kind of training whatsoever. This is just happening. It's moving, it's fluid. I don't, I don't know when his mood's changing. I can tell, but, I, but he might already be in the middle when I can see it. So we have to have Fred kind of stop and rate. And we had a rate co-rate with Fred. There's not time to get into it in that level of depth, but I do want to comment that we had a level like a rate or co-rate going. And there were some you know, discrepancies where I would say, I'm fine, and I'd say, look, I saw you check out like five minutes ago. Here's how I knew. So trying to teach some of that. And they'd say, well, you know, he was trying to push through. Sometimes he would kind of, it helped him, I guess, be more accurate at tactical and things like that. And then again, Fred really wanted to get home. Fred wanted to preserve his marriage. He wanted to preserve his role with his kids, his, his father. So he was highly motivated. And he was left with enough skill from his injury, preserved enough, to be able to engage in this fairly high level, sophisticated, I mean, this is stuff one of us could do, right? Pretty high level stuff. Not for everybody. But for Fred, this helped him get home. You know, this helped him manage his day. The other thing it did, back to that triangle from an integration standpoint, I was involved, although I'm like the, just, the, I'm like the architect, framer guy. The other people put the, the guts in it, like the PT put stuff in there about pain and, and, and descriptors. The psychologist put descriptors in there about mood that they got from sessions with Fred. So it pulls everybody in to this effort, and this tool becomes this kind of like, you know, the confluence of all of our efforts goes into this tool versus, hey, Fred, I've got this cool tool, and the PT's got a tool, and the psychologist's got a tool. Like, that's not going to work in brain injuries. I'm going to work anywhere. We own that. But this thing becomes this organizing tool that we all contribute to to try to build in all the different things that we're doing on behalf of each client just as much as that triangle kind of did it at a, at a much more molar level. Okay. Last one, on the stretch, 24 minutes to go. Amy, all right, so Amy, and I don't mean to say there's two women and one man, that's supposed to be a gender thing. Matter of fact, the, the rates of injury with men are much higher uh, than they are of women. women. Um, and men do dumber stuff, right? So that's part of what that's about. So, I'm comfortable saying that. So this is Amy. So Amy came to us. She was, what was Amy? 19, I think. She was nine years post, um, or 10 years post, rather. So she was injured at an early age. Terrible story, as all of these are. She and her dad, this is like, you can't make this stuff up. She and her dad were out to cut a Christmas tree down. So they stopped at a tree farm. Wasn't parking on the tree farm side, so they parked across the street in the other lot. Amy's dad took the tree across the road. She was dawdling doing something, then she booked across the road and got hit by a car. And I have a nine-year-old son. So this is like, the older I've gotten and aged in this field, it's become more and more sort of personally impactful because I can see these things happening in a much different way. Um, so anyway, but Amy came to us and she was a mess. 10 years of behavior had occurred since her injury. Non-compliant psychiatric admissions, arrest for possession, of various substances multiple admissions to previous residential and outpatient brain injury programs, short stays, you know, uh, big problems. Admitting from, a, she, she came, she went in with a, her most recent admission prior to us was in a brain injury facility. She went in there and she had, a, if anybody's worked in substance abuse, which Amy had a lot of features of, they have unbelievable verbal repertoires, right? Really, it makes sense, right? Selection is what it is, we know that fundamentally. They have, the best ones have really highly developed descriptive skills of their own situations. In this, back to that Sigrid Glenn reference made that I made earlier, more in the manipulative vein. 
So how do they work their way out of something through, and my 12 year old daughter's pretty good at this too, um, right? So some of it comes in honestly. So nonetheless, all of this stuff was happening. So she had talked to Braintree program into letting her live in an apartment. By the time we got her with her, she had slept with a couple of the other residents in nearby apartments and sold some of her furniture to buy trucks. So there were problems. Frequent relapse, mood instability, uh, refusal resistance to treatment, high risk behavior. So she was a cutter, burner, borderline, right? As some would describe those kinds of features, SIV elopement and promiscuity. So like the whole full monitor. She was going, she was in the community, but not going to work or volunteering, not attending fellowship, limited social network and leisure options. And the family said there was no way she can come home. So she came to us essentially with like papers. Like once we admit her, there's nowhere else for her to go. All right, including home, of course. I'll spare you the, well, we'll do complications first. I'll spare you the big triangle. Okay. So for Amy, complications I'm presenting in a little bit of a different sort. So when she was coming to us, the questions were, are you willing to provide treatment to someone that's at this high level of risk? I mean, she had been cutting and burning with some frequency. That's dangerous. We know that as clinicians. And administrators, that makes them leaky too. Clinicians, it gets us interested, not so much for the administrators. Promote, promote and establish, how are we going to promote and establish stability? How are we going to encourage her to participate in treatment? And how are we going to optimize for independence? So those were our goals. We were thinking like, how the hell are we going to do the first couple days of this thing? Amy had different ideas. She said, I need to live independently. I need to work, I need to drive, and I need a guy. And then I'll be fine. So that was Amy. So we were sort of on different pages, you could say. Um, so what's interesting about Amy when she first, what I'm going to show you doesn't necessarily demonstrate this, but I feel compelled to, to, to describe it briefly. You know, I had just read some of Vollmer's stuff. It wasn't that far out of Temple when Amy came. And I had read a lot of Vollmer stuff on NCR. And I thought, all right, from a functional standpoint, I don't know what's going on. Because if any of you are familiar with the cutting and burning literature, it's not clear, right? Some of it is escape. Like, there's relief-seeking kinds of hypotheses out there. And I, from the work I've done in the last 20 years, they're plausible. There's also a lot of attentional hypotheses out there. And I believe that those are plausible, too. So without knowing any of that, but having to manage the risk at some level, the high probability of these behaviors coming in the door, what I suggested we do from an NCR standpoint was, at any point in a session where she said, I'm fucking done, she was fucking done. Let her be done. Don't make her stay. If she says, I don't want to fucking meet, don't make her fucking meet. I don't mean to send you out there with a bunch of F-bombs, but this was Amy's language. And then I said, so that's the escape. We're just going to cover that base as best we can. Let her go away from the session whenever she wants. And I, and I did a great fortune and misfortune, depending upon how you looked at it, being a preferred staff for her. And there were two or three others of us. And I said, okay, so whenever she's in high crisis, she can come and find me. I'll stop doing whatever I'm doing. I'll, I'll, I'll delay a session. I'll postpone what I'm doing. I'll step away from my machine. And I told these other three or four staff to do the same thing because, why am I doing this? We all know the answer to this. From an NCR standpoint, we wanted to make full availability of escape and attentional reinforcement available. So instead of, because I my belief was, if we delayed any of that, it would potentiate risk for cutting, burning, elopement, or aggression, some other really profoundly dangerous or crisis behavior. So it was really difficult, but she didn't cut, she didn't burn, she didn't leave. And then what I started doing insidiously in my sessions was building in demands. So if she came to me, I said, all right, I know you're upset, but you and I, we can talk for a couple minutes, and she'd bring me these really graphic pictures and tell me these terrible stories about thoughts and dreams she was having, and I would, that's not my special area, I don't mean to portray it that way, but I just listened. And then I would say, okay, heard you, let's fill out this tool that the psychologist from the CBT, Ben, was working on for like a coping tool to organize thoughts and things like that, and I would start working on that with her. But after I heard her out, then I started introducing the tool before I heard her out. And then I started saying, all right, you gotta wait five minutes, give me five minutes, I just gotta finish this up. So I started building in these little delays. By the way, on the back end, what I'm doing is, every day she goes without cutting, burning, eloping, having sex with somebody, or punching somebody, we go to Dunkin' Donuts in the morning. So hooray. So we had a lot of gulatos or whatever we had at the time. Um, but that, but then schedule reinforcement in place, covered our bases with NCR, kept her out of crisis. Then, okay, cool, good, a couple check marks there. Now what do we do with the rest of her life? How do we get her to live more, how do we get her off this campus? How do we get her into the community? She wanted to drive, she wanted to go shopping, she wanted to have a boyfriend. 
Sounds like my daughter. She wanted to live independently. Not my daughter yet. I'm getting there, I guess. So it's like, well, how do you take somebody who looks like this and requires this kind of incredible structure for that? So in comes this thing called Facebook, right? Which is just our language. That's not anywhere else. So the phase plan, basically, so what's a phase plan? So this is a little general, um, and I skipped a couple of slides just again to keep on time. So a common goal of individuals we serve is to answer questions. So this isn't a question that's germane to Amy. This is what lots of people say come to Can they ever come home again? Can they work again? Can they live somewhere else other than rural pond? Can they not need somebody around them all the time? And the clients, they have same or more challenging questions. I'm going to get the hell out of here. So we have to think about what kinds of skills are necessary and how we're going to establish and maintain them. And obviously no one skill makes somebody supremely independent. So we have to think about what combinations of those skills and repertoires will achieve that, or at least get them there. And I, I forgot, I think, as I'm realizing it now, to put the distinction in the language in the slide that's ever-present in my mind. And that's the difference between time and readiness. So someone comes in and says, when the fuck am I getting out of here? And I say, I don't know. We've got 90 days. And that, nobody, nobody, everybody hates that part of the answer. Because 90 days to me feels like 20 minutes. To them, it feels like a decade. So I say, I don't know. We have to think about time, but we also have to think about readiness. And this is how I approach the conversation with Amy. Amy said, when can I live, when can I get out of Will Pond and live in an apartment? I said, I don't know. But let's talk about what it looks like to be ready to do that. And let's back in from there to a con let's talk to the team about, because again, we're looking at this room table full of people, none of whom she'd meet with, by the way, coming in the door. So think about it. She's not giving a crap about what anybody's talking about. This is less about awareness of her, by the way, I guess, for the moment. She doesn't want it, and everybody's dumbfounded. In a typical outpatient, she'd have been discharged. As an outpatient, they'd have either showed up at her door, which is not traditional, and she'd have said, no thanks, and they'd have left very nicely, and then they would have said, recommend discharge, client out of student services. Or she would have went into a clinic, and they would have said, how can I help you? And she would have said, you can't possibly help me. And they would have said, I mean, these people will try hard, but it's not within their wherewithal or their arsenal to treat people who were this non-compliant or at risk. They discharge them. So Amy goes back home, Amy does something at risk, she gets psychiatrically admitted, she gets incarcerated, she comes to us. That's what happens. So we have to start thinking about how do we get this, so all these, what the reason I got to that, which I just remembered, was because I was talking about this interdisciplinary team, which really struggles to engage with her. So here comes the behavior analyst, right? And it's great, because this science works. And we start thinking through it conceptually, theoretically, all the way down to the application of it all. And we come up with this idea about, all right, so how do we get you, let's talk about how you get from one to one in the community to small group. From small group to supervised drop-offs or you know distant supervision, so it looks like we're not with you, but we kind of are, all the way up to when we're not with you. And you've got to do that, obviously, before you can get into a different setting. But then you got to get through days with crises. Then you got to be showering every day. But then you got to have something to do every day. Like everybody at the table, once we start talking about it like that, they have opinions about what Amy has to be able to do that are really well founded and thought through. They just have no idea how to get her to do it. So. Again, in comes the science of behavior analysis. So we put these phase plans together. So, again, getting there. These look like multiple differential reinforcement contingencies, right? But they give us the ability to specifically attend to the individual behaviors across disciplines. And I'll show you a slide in a second about this. And we can subject some behaviors to reinforcement at high rates, some to low or zero rates, and still others we can run DRAs with. So we can run concurrent DRH, DRL, and DRA. It's not easy to do, but we need somebody to stop punching people and yelling. So we need a DRL, DRO. We need somebody to follow through or comply. We need a DRH. We need somebody to cope, which is something they haven't done before. We need a DRA. And we can't do these things one at a time. We have to do them together. Because all of those things together in combination represent phases of readiness. Right? So I say to Amy, three months, nine months, three months, some number, three months. We start talking as a team first. And then I'm ready to go sit with Amy and say, all right, Amy, we can consider you in three months or 90 days for a less structured setting than ours. But here's what you need to do. So I'm giving her a time frame. And that's, we all, like, is predictability might be the first or second most important feature of behavior, right? Predictable. At some point, it's not. I get that. But 
for the purposes of establishing stability and acquisition, it's profoundly important. So we talk about time frames, but then we're digging into readiness. And for readiness criteria, we can start talking more you know, specifically about repertoires and how we can measure those repertoires and in what ways you're going to need to show or not show those repertoires. So close attention to schedules of reinforcement to establish and maintain behaviors. How long does somebody need to do what things before some part of their situation changes? Okay, so not only then because of all of this and how stretched out this is temporarily, not only do we need to collect data within the day, but also, pardon me, across days, across weeks, and across months. Like, we have to think to the end and then back to the beginning. Just because just wait 90 days and say, well, how'd you do? Are you ready for an apartment? She's going to say, hell yeah. And I'm going to say, well, I don't know. And everyone's, everyone's probably going to have a different opinion. So this plan pulls all that together at the very beginning. And then everything we do is interpreted through the plan, which is wonderful. It helps organize the team efforts. It gives Amy some sense of, how am I doing? Even if it's not great, I know predictably to give her a status update, how to get back on track or whether she's off track. I can tell her parents kind of what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. We can map it out. As importantly, we can talk to her funder. So not only does that sort of parameter diagram give some sense of organization, but this plan organizes the behavior on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. So then what we do to get this thing kind of started is we start monitoring behavior within the day. Back to that idea of hour to hour, and we have these daily schedule templates. And this is what a daily schedule might look like at Remed. You know, the hours of the day here and the activities. A space, again, rate or co-rater, right? Staff and client initials, because obviously Amy thinks everything's fine and she's great. So for each of these, and Amy is representative of many people we've run plans like this, we have to know which behaviors and skills to monitor. And we only have so much for those of us that make tables in Word or try to make cool things like this, you run out of real estate. So we have to be really thoughtful about just space. How much can I get on this paper? What's even gonna look, look visually, um, what's gonna make sense? So we have to prioritize behaviors and skills, again, monitor space limitations, consider how often to rate or quantify behaviors and skills, and consider intervals for ratings. So we can't have Amy forever. We started at an hourly rating. We can't have her there forever, that's unreasonable. We've got to fade that to every other hour, every four hours, the beginning of the day and the end of the day. And again, this rater co rater system has to exist for a while, but eventually, if she's going to be independent, we have to be able to fade that at some point. So on this side part here, we put information for us and for her there. Consider what could go here, what would be helpful, supportive, or clarifying. Client and staff should reference and review this. And I'm going to show you an example of one of these put together, which I hope is visible to everybody. Oh, good, that was All right, so for Amy, we did follow through. Like, you just got to follow your schedule. Got to comply. Comply with program guidelines. Like, don't have sex with anybody, don't punch anybody, and don't be like high risk behavior kind of stuff. INC behavior, INC ratings. So she was somebody who was always urgent about everything, and she came to everybody about it all the time. So INC is issues and concerns, which is our sort of way of shaping behavior around addressing issues in a delayed and organized way. All right, so we had ratings for her there. We had ratings for mood and urges uh, rating, right? So we had to know how, how strong were those mood, and that was largely around substance abuse stuff, and then coping. And we used this rating scale, because that gives us a little bit, we're giving up a little bit of, I think, cleanliness, if you will, quantify, quantitatively, but we're gaining a little bit of qualitative advantage. And I think from the shaping side, it gives us a little bit of leverage as well. So we can, we can ascribe different descriptions to wishes and concerns, mood and urges, and coping. So for issues and concerns, if she gets she gets a zero, if she comes to you, you try to redirect, but she's adamant and demands to say something about it now and have it addressed and resolved right now. Well, she can't. She can stay there and live with us for the rest of her life, okay? But she can't stay there and move it into an apartment. So that gives us an ability from a shaping side, like you know, back of the box sort of rearing to front of the box and pressing the lever. We can move those ratings around through the contingencies that we identify across weeks of this plan. And say, look. For the first couple weeks, you can't be a zero, but you can be a one. You can need a lot of help, and we have to do something about it there, but you can't be in crisis. But in the later parts of the phases of this plan, that'll make sense in a minute, you gotta be at like a two or a three. You gotta be able to write it down on your own and wait, or come and let us know, and then wait till later to follow up. That's a transfer, generalizable, transferable skill to a less structural setting. But in this point right now, can't, that can't move. So that gives us some flexibility in terms of the shaping process, which I argue is, really infused into all of this. Did the same thing for moods and urges in terms of managing them, 
and coping, which is cut off, I apologize, but it follows a similar sort of zero to three, zero being the most intense, which maybe seems a little cattywampus, but it was what we did. So zero was really bad, really strong, really intense. Three was, I got it, I'm under control, and I'm managing it, all right? So that gives us some room. Well, that's interesting. Oh, good. You guys can see that. Okay. So a phase point. It's funky. For those of you that present, when you go from landscape to portrait, PowerPoint doesn't like that. You can't do it with the same topic. Hope that's helpful to somebody. Okay. So this is what, this is a general, like this is intended to be an orientation of what a phase point looks like. So again, same, the nice thing is it ties into, we tied into the triangle. We're trying to keep these dots connected. There's got to be something to address medical stability. There's got to be something to address mood and behavior stability. And there's got to be something to address SAP, stable activity plan. And this is interdisciplinary input coming through and through to this thing. So everybody has some input, and it looks like a ton. But if you're talking to somebody that wants to live more independently, be in the community more independently, and maybe work eventually, these are necessary skills. And again, back to that qualitative kind of Laker based rating scale, she doesn't have to start out being awesome in all these things. She can need a lot of help in the beginning, but she's at least got to be complying with the help of provider and then delay to get help and then try it on her own before she gets help and then eventually be able to do it on her own. And that's going to take time, which is why these phases move. I didn't get to the reinforcer side yet, which I will momentarily. So, this is what these things look like. So we have these list of skills here, and this is again built to orient uh, an audience to this but, um So in phase one, as we know, we're stabilizing and acquiring behavior. So that means we have to be sensitive to limited skills. That means we have to think about which expect or which repertoires are most important and prioritize those. We can't go after all of this full stop um, from the beginning. We need more dense schedules of reinforcement, Dunkin' Donuts. And NCR access to me and a couple of other people or grades. Again, should consider NCR. So we were covering those bases. So as long as Amy met criteria, we and I, I tried to get in the slide, but you can't see it visually. So we had a the next slide I show we'll, we'll have a spot where the target criteria were. So we used those ratings and said, look, you got to have all ones and twos and less than this many zeros per day to meet criteria. We eventually got to that. I hope that makes sense with those ratings. And if she did that, then she got the Dunkin' Donuts. And that meant she stayed out of crisis, that meant she attended sessions, and that meant she was moving through the skill building process a little bit. And then if she did that for four weeks, we went to phase two, which was amp it up a little bit and change access in terms of reinforcers. The other thing we built into the first phase was the last two have to be contiguous, consecutive. So you can't do one, miss three, do one, miss two, do one, miss two, and do the fourth and say, Bruh. like that's not momentum. Right? You gotta like you can struggle a little bit on the front end, but the last two you have to you have to book them back to back. That's gonna show us that the skills are established. Right? It's gonna give us some sense of stability with respect to those behaviors. Okay. So phase two, right? Acquisition and a little bit of generalization, where some skills should require less support. That makes sense. How to begin generalization. Maybe going from going to me to be able to go into other staff. We're now generalizing across staff. Um, what privileges come with this phase? That's green that language. We don't use that language. That's like client language. They look at it as privileges. So what, what access? Right? That's all. What, what access does she get with phase two? So she wants to get out of phase one. So phase two might be small group outings. Knowing that phase three is drop-offs. Knowing that phase one is having to do things on campus, phase two is maybe getting to go, you know, scope out some of the sheltered workshop. Not that, that, not that she wanted to make a career out of a sheltered workshop, but that was a stepping stone to like volunteer competitive employment, which might be built into phase three. So we take these big fat, big fat carrots, these big old reinforcers that we know are temporarily way too delayed, way too large, they're large, but they're way too late for the purposes of where people's behavior are when we admit them, which is there in the smaller student world. We have to somehow make these repertoires and these schedules work over time. And this is how we've gone about the business of stretching those things out. So again, some reinforcers shift to weekly. We're shifting schedules, right? Shifting from daily to weekly schedules. Um, 
Last three weeks must be consecutive of phase three, or phase two, right? So we're going from last two consecutive to the last three of the second phase. Again, trying to establish more momentum and put a little more pressure. Because at the end of 90 days, we promised her a shot at another spot. If that's going to happen, we have to know it's solid. And we're not going to, you know, we're not going to back off on that. And we're putting this behavior to the test, but we're doing it in a really comprehensive and rigorous way. Okay, so phase three, generalization of maintenance. Skills have to be at a minute sister and pen. Again, we got at that through those ratings, and we maintain the rate or co rater thing for quite a while through this. Limited generalization remains. She's done it across environments and staff. Now we're talking maintenance. Privileges should be all in place and maintained. Mostly we weekly reinforcers at this point are faded. The other thing about these that I think is really cool is the completion of the phase becomes the primary reinforcer. And if I can't do it in two minutes. But there's a ton of condition reinforcement packed into this. So what happens is these signatures on the schedule hour to hour become condition reinforcers, because that means things are moving. The completion of or the accumulation of five or six or seven schedules that she and them would sit, she and I would sit down and look at at the end of the week to determine whether she booked a week, like that's our part of our language, was powerfully reinforcing. Booking a week was powerfully reinforcing because then she only had three more to go, and then two more to go, and one more to go. So all we're talking about is pieces of paper that become really powerful reinforcers because they're you know, strengthened by the fact that they're linked to access. And ultimately that access is all the way out in time as far as 90 days. And we, we, it's not a part of this talk, but sometimes we say that people, we don't just say, hey, great, day one, let's get started. Like, things are way too messy. We just say, look, I look at this plan, I review it with them, I describe it, I say, but you gotta be ready for this. And here's what prerequisite phase plan readiness looks like. That's funky to say, but in such a way, that's what we did. And then the other thing that would happen that, that again, is not in here is there was such a thing as like, if you missed a week, like that's okay. But if you missed two in a row, then you're on notice. So if you're in phase two and you miss two a week, that's a problem. If you miss two in a row, it's almost like shoots and miners, it sounds like. We would sometimes move people back into the prior phase because we're losing control over the behavior. So that's a contingency factor into this as well. So there's a lot of ways that it can be complicated. It's not a simple thing to do. Uh, we do describe it in this article that we wrote to some extent, but not in great detail, and not in terrific behavior analytic language because it's published in the brain injury community. But it's intended to try to help guide people's efforts to try to get high-risk folks or challenging and complex folks back into the community and living more independently. And so this is, again, in the backdrop, what we would really kind of use is something that looks like this. So this would be it every day. There'd be, there'd be like, you know, we'd have spaces for data collection here each day, and we would kind of like look at the daily schedule at the end of the day at a wrap up, or at the very beginning of the next day, input data. There'd be target criteria over here, like I said, ones and twos, no zeros, or twos and threes, no ones, or whatever. And if they met criteria, then they booked that week. So we would fill one of these out every day, but it encapsulated a week's worth of data. And that let, that, that let Amy know whether she was, so we knew right away whether we were on track or not. And in the midst of doing this, sometimes we would restart the weeks. We had a couple of different methods that we used if somebody had a really difficult time. So um, it's not for everybody, but it was a really powerful way for us to take a large reinforcer and a wide array of challenging behavior and try to organize it somehow. And again, it starts with the four term up into that triangular model of high minds, which I think elegantly and beautifully illustrates how we should be thinking about behavior, and then builds it into that sort of neurobehavioral philosophy that I presented, and then it goes out in these directions that I've sort of reviewed with you today. Thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for buckling up. I know I covered a lot of ground and I did it rapidly. Um, let's see if this will get me back to my last slide. That would be awesome. Thank you, Dave. Well done. Thank you. And they would all have stories about when the onset happened, and they would recognize that things were different now, but they couldn't quite see when that was happening. So I was just wondering if there's been any kind of generalization. I mean, that's an area that could be expanded to see if that could be helpful with that population. So that's a really good question. I can say we've worked with people with schizophrenia, but then a brain injury. 
Um, there's also such a thing as post-injury psychosis that can occur. So I, I, I can't speak at all to having worked with someone exclusively with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but I don't see why the same application wouldn't be appropriate. Especially if you think that there's enough awareness, right? Um, and by the way, Amy's awareness wasn't great. So this is another way back to that, back to engineer this behavior change without awareness. If you have somebody with a mental health diagnosis who's not agreeing with anything you're saying, but you're, you're demonstrating how you can open up access in a graduated way with compliance, you can get there. Now for our sakes, that still means some folks like this still need to live in some kind of structured environment where they can be monitored. We don't get all the way out to fully independent, but they get more into the community and you know, more independent than it's preferred, that they can maybe access public transportation or be in the community at some level without constant supervision. And I think that's further reinforced to be explored. Yeah, good question, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah. I just had a question. Um, I hear a lot about like brain rest, but I just want to have you take on brain that. rest. Yeah, this is for injuries, sure. and they, they said that you have to like rest your brain out. I don't know exactly how that works. But. Yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty general term, right? Uh, I also did mention neuroplasticity, right? So that neuroplasticity is there's hope for exon exonal shear, right? So that is just because you ripped up some stuff doesn't mean it's done for good, right? There's rerouting and sprouting and things that happen. That's affected by age, of course, but it's also affected, and this gets back to the Sammy Kapanen video, by rest. And that's built into a lot of these concussion protocols, which I'm getting more familiar with now as my kids are aging up into sports and my son doesn't play football yet, so I don't know how that's gonna go. But nonetheless, um, yeah, rest is an important feature because what we do, what we have learned or what the research suggests is Contingent exposure, obviously contingent exposure to concussions after a concussion is bad juju. But exposure to high stim, that's why they have protocols for kids to be home from school, kids to not watch TV, kids not to be on electronics. Those are features of brain rest. I mean, there's recommendations for just everyday people, like before you go to bed and how much time you should sit in front of a monitor, and all those things are real. But nonetheless, especially with respect to so concussed individual, they're even more important. Right, those are some of the things kind of get back to that point that Sam Manthan and I were talking about uh, in terms of how how does a you know a headbang represent an EO because it's the onset of a concussion potentially. Uh, and there's a whole series of neurochemical interactions. And how much rest does that individual need to be able to respond in a more consistent, predictable, stable way to the contingencies that are being presented to them? You know? So now that's con that's con that's immediately confronted by the fact that if you're doing an escape intervention. Uh, you want to extinguish escape, you don't want to let them headbang and say, oh, your brain probably hurts, you should take a break. Like, that's going to be rough. But somewhere in the middle, there's some ground to explore, I would say. Right? So yeah, rest is, I think, important from a day-to-day -day standpoint, but also certainly with respect to any kind of neurologic insult. Anybody else? I just want to thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You guys are great.